Would you want to get two for one? Okay. Um, I'm going to call the meeting uh, to order at 6.51 uh, on uh, June 28th. Um, and uh, this is uh, going to be a public hearing to receive comment uh, on the uh, currently proposed uh, new uh, zoning regulations. Uh, they are, of course, in uh, draft form only at this point. Uh, I'm going to call the meeting to order. Uh, Steve, if you would, could we do a roll call? Certainly. I'm going to start uh, virtually. Ms. Wells? Here. Ms. Tabachnik? Here. Mr. Cantor? Here. Mr. Mushak? Mr. Williams? Here. Mr. Rowena? Here. Ms. Jordan Byron? Present. Ms. Langallis? Here. Mr. Chapin? Present. And Mr. Shoma? Here. Um, we uh, have the entire commission here this evening. Do we? Oh, we have one uh, commission member who is not here. Right. Uh, but uh, he is an alternate. Um, but I'm not sure that we need to seat anyone. We're not taking any action this evening. Right. Uh, so uh, as usual, everyone uh, is um, uh, welcome uh, to uh, participate. Um, I'm not going to read uh, the statement that I uh, read uh, last week. Uh, I, but let me explain um, how uh, the public hearing will will proceed. Um, Mr. Kleppen may have a few uh, comments he uh, wishes uh, to make. Um, the, I see him shaking his head. <laughs> so we will go directly uh, into uh, public uh, comment. Um, we ask uh, that you be uh, as brief as possible. Uh, obviously, a lot of people here this evening, we want to give everyone uh, an opportunity to uh, speak who has not spoken uh, before. Uh, if you spoke uh, on this uh, last week, um, what we will do is permit you, uh, if you wish to, speak a second time after everyone else who has not spoken uh, has had an opportunity uh, to speak. Um, we uh, ask that to the extent that you can, um, you not be redundant. Uh, if you basically are gonna say the same thing as the person who spoke before you, uh, we, we just ask that uh, you do that as uh, briefly as possible so that uh, as many people as possible will have an opportunity to speak. Uh, we also uh, ask that uh, uh, you keep uh, your comments um, um, collegial um, so that uh, uh, no one uh, is uh, offended. I think it's, it, it's quite possible to make uh, your, even your passionate statements um, uh, without uh, going overboard. Uh, we ask if you would, if you could silence your phones uh, so that uh, we can hear uh, people who uh, wish to speak. Uh, understand, uh, it, it's not our intention uh, to comment immediately after people speak. Um, and uh, you may not feel that we are, but we are listening uh, to what you're saying. And uh, I know it's the intention of uh, all of the members of the uh, commission to take your comments into consideration uh, before we reach any decision. And I would point out that we're quite far uh, from reaching any decision. We have tonight's public hearing. Uh, if time permits, uh, after all the comments have been uh, made, we'll begin a conversation among ourselves um, that you're more than welcome to uh, uh, sit and listen to. Uh, we'll be discussing uh, uh, this matter throughout the summer months. In all likelihood, we will be holding uh, a final public hearing in the fall uh, to go over uh, what at that point 
uh, we expect uh, will will be uh, uh, the uh, final draft of uh, the regulations. Uh, so sometime September, October, um, we uh, expect to adopt the new regulations, uh, which will not then in all likelihood go into effect until uh, the new year. Um, the, uh, this public hearing does not end your opportunity to uh, have public input. Uh, there are, are still forms up on uh, the uh, planning and zoning website uh, that give you an opportunity to raise uh, additional questions, um, uh, which will be responded to by uh, the staff. Um, what we'll uh, do, I don't know how many uh, people there are online who wish to speak, Two right now. Right now, there are only two. Uh, last week, there were uh, far more. Um, we will allow two people in the audience to speak, uh, and then we'll allow someone who's online to speak. And we'll do that until there are uh, no more people online. Typically, there are more people here who wish to speak than uh, there are uh, online. Uh, it's now 6.58. Uh, we will take a 10-minute break uh, at 9 o'clock and um, hope to <laughs> complete, complete the hearing, uh, if at all possible, by, by 10.30 this evening. Uh, with that, uh, uh, Steve, do you want to start with first name on the list? Sure. Um, before Ms. Wells has her hand up, Mr. Chairman. Pardon me? Ms. Wells is her hand I'm up. I'm sorry. Galen, please. You answered my question. You were saying that people can speak again, and I was just wondering if we had any time limit on the, you know, quit time in mind. But you said, yes, 1030 is when we're that, in the expectation. We met that expectation uh, last week. There are somewhat fewer people here. Uh, again, I see people who were here last week who may or may not speak. So I'm hopeful uh, we'll be able to uh, uh, end by 10.30. Uh, first speaker, first name is Ted, and I apologize, I can't tell if that's his. Okay, thank you. All right, we ask uh, that you please just give us your name and your address. Hi, um, I'm Ted Zakar. I live on 199 Gregory Boulevard, and I also have property on 1 Hermity Court. Okay, um, I want to thank you people for doing what you do, because I, I know it's hard because I serve on a lot of boards. Uh, my thing is, is uh, you have to think about the people in this town and the people in East Norwalk. East Norwalk is a small, I've lived in East Norwalk for 72 years. Okay, East Norwalk is a small community. And there's people in this, in this audience that went to kindergarten here like I did, and they stayed here. And basically what you're doing to these people is you're I mean, I'm not saying you're doing it on purpose or whatever. Don't get me wrong. You're taking the heart out of them. I mean, you're taking something that they lived in all their lives and they've lived in this home all their lives. And the next thing you know, there's going to be two family homes right next to them. I mean, they, you go on, you know, you can go on with the parking and, the, and all of that stuff. But I'm just concerned about how the people feel about their homes what they've lived in, what they've lived in in all their life. And it's just, it's just overcrowding. And of course, you know that. I mean, you did something up on Winfield Street, which was fine. Okay. You did something, you're going to do something at the bank where I used to live. Matter of fact. Okay. They tore my house down over there. They tore my house down where they did, uh, where Spinnaker did something over there by the old half corporation. But that was a piece of property. Okay. This is where people you're taking their actual homes and you're disturbing them. That's basically what's happening if, if this zoning passes. Okay. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Okay. Uh, Vic Palladino. All right, my name's Vic Palladino. I live at 7 Muriel Street, Norwalk, Connecticut. And I thought you said everybody here is P&Z members? Except for staff. Yes. Okay, and just a quick, another quick question. 
once you come up with final proposals that you guys and ladies agree on, it get, has to get passed by the Common Council? I thought no, it was. No, it does not. Just you people? Yes. Oh, okay. Now I know even better who to unload on. So, <laughs> I, um, again, my name's uh, Vic Palladino, and unfortunately, it should take about five minutes. Unfortunately. Yeah, yeah, yeah. My name is Vic Palladino. Unfortunately, this should take about five minutes, hopefully six. Unfortunately, I received two of these uh, lucky placards, I guess you could call them. And once I saw zoning changes, I got that feeling like I did when I got my uh, draft notice about 55 years ago. You know? So let me begin. Um, I was, uh, I'm going to be reading, hopefully not. It's going to be somewhat redundant. I wasn't at the last meeting. Uh, I was born, raised, and lived in New York all my life for better and or worse. And lately, the quality of everyday life is getting worse with the increased number of people, vehicles, and related societal, societal support problems. Addition, although I am not familiar with all of the proposed zone changes, I am most definitely and vociferously against the proposal to downgrade single family housing zones to multifamily zones. And please. This may take more than five minutes then. <laughs> and uh, please note that I use the downgrade term because that is exactly what this is. Not new zoning, which sounds much more innocuous and soothing to the heirs and mind. Uh, this downgrade zoning is a slap in the face, actually more of a body slam to Norwalk citizens who have worked or are working hard to pay off 10 or 20 or 30 year mortgages uh, to pay the high taxes in this town, the high real estate taxes in this town and to enjoy the more tranquil lifestyle of having chosen to live in a single family zone as opposed to being forced to live in a multifamily zone and on even much great of even much greater significance uh, would be the loss in property values uh, directly re related to the downgrade and i have I have uh, immediately, um, I have a, immediately adjacent and opposite to the, I live immediately and uh, adjacent opposite to the proposed downgrade zone opposite Stu Leonard's along and perpendicular to Dry Hill Road where residences are single family on small lots with minimal driveways. The streets are narrow, uneven, and have residents' cars parked on them. One can easily understand the angst and, <clears throat> and betrayal with the arrival of more people, more cars, and more noise, and most significantly, the downward direction of property valuations. Also, with the Norwalk skyline having started and continuing to look like Stamford 2.0, as evidenced by the huge buildings on Water Street, Monroe Street, West Avenue, and a proposal for the parking lot opposite the Sono Post Office. And just most recently, it was noted in the paper that another 200 units uh, are to be built near the Sono train station. And have you noticed that there is actually another city being built in the Glover Avenue area? This madness cannot continue unabated. I have immediately, um, oh, uh, bear with me a second here. I think that a reckoning will be coming soon, if not already started, due to adverse effects to be felt by all of the, by all of us, whether we are in, actually in or just merely adjacent to downgraded zones or not. Continued increased auto, um, 
The following effects can't help. I, I don't know how people can say, oh, it's not happening or it won't happen. And the effects that are going to be felt and are already being felt continued increased auto and truck traf uh, traffic on most uh, roads that are the same size roads since the early 1950s. Uh, a, a, a strain on water supply demands, a strain on sewage treatment demands, a strain on electricity demands, a strain on the schools, the needs for more policemen, firemen, teachers, and sanitation people, a strain on hospitals and medical personnel, and a strain on social services. We're coming here. In, in closing, and with the foregoing statements and comments in mind, I strongly urge the powers that be to remove any downgrading of single family zones or any residential zones for that matter RZ, as these proposals move forward. If they are not removed, I urge all members uh, to both reject and defeat the proposals as they now stand. It is my contention and strong belief that the elected officials of Norwalk and those appointed to positions of power and influence should first, foremost, and always represent and listen to the concerns, opinions, and well-being of the Norwalk residents. The wishes and wants of those who do not own homes in Norwalk or do not live in Norwalk should be of secondary concern at best if at all. Um, the, char the, the character, integrity, stability, tranquility, and well-being of established Norwalk resident zones must not be altered or compromised in order for more people to reside in Norwalk. I reiterate, not everyone can live in Norwalk. In Norwalk especially to the detriment and expense of those who already live here. And with that, I thank you for your time. Thank you. Uh, so next we'll do an online, and if for anyone who's online, uh, you can use the raise your hand tool, it's at the bottom of your screen. Um, if you're dialed in on a phone, you hit star nine. Um, so first is Douglas Peoples. You there, Doug? Doug, if you're speaking, we can't hear you. Um, you might have to change your audio input. I will we'll come back to you. Uh, so next is Linnell Jones. Hello, thank you. My name is Linnell Jones. My address is 10 Point Road in the Wilson Point neighborhood. My husband and I also owned 8 Point Road and two and a half Nathan Hale Drive for a decade. Property with a tidal pond and property on the water with a dock next to tidal wetlands in the coastal flood zone. There is no question that over the past 20 years, 10 years, even the last five years, the flooding of major roads including State Highway Route 136, which cuts off all access to our neighborhood, has become increasingly common during high tides. Today, storms are dropping increased quantities of rain in shorter periods, making storm drainage critical and also flooding roads. No emergency vehicle can drive through a foot of water. So public health and safety, which I have to believe is the number one concern that all of us share is at risk when roads flood. Yesterday's New York Times front page had the article, bigger deluges threaten pipes across the US, 50% more rain than systems can take. This article offered proof that FEMA and the National Ocean Act, Ocean Act and Atmospheric Administration are not using the right data. 
if FEMA and NOAA standards have been proven, and they have, to be inadequate for predicting rainfall, then maybe only relying on FEMA standards and not thinking about public health and safety in the event of floods in your zoning decisions is a bad idea, dated and uninformed. What could be more important than public health and safety? Future flooding is a serious concern we cannot ignore in Norwalk. Today, Norwalk Hour had an article, Norwalk's future waterfronts to be reshaped by new zoning, concerns of future flooding raised. The Hour article mentions that the Norwalk Maritime Commercial Zones proposed change to CD5W, allowing mixed use residential, but it didn't mention the fact that it didn't mention the lawsuit from 1989 when Deep sued the city of Norwalk for trying to increase density on Water Street in the coastal flood zone in conflict with the agreed upon Norwalk Coastal Program. The hour also failed to mention Deep stopped the recent moves to higher density mixed use residential in the coastal flood zones in Stanford. New Haven and Stratford. So how is Norwalk so sure DEEP or the EPA will not intervene when they did in other cities, other Connecticut cities? City leaders and all of you know that the Connecticut Institute for Resilience and Climate Adaptation, CIRCA, is telling Norwalk to plan for an increase of about three feet of water in our coastal flood zones specifically Water Street. Before you approve any more increased density in the coastal flood zone, which means rezoning the current maritime uh, commercial zone to CD5W, please ask about the 1989 lawsuit and share it with the public, which was like the recent consent decree with DEEP, kept quiet out of the news, not shared even with the health department or the water quality committee. Why was the deep consent decree kept quiet when the POCD is all about transparency and public engagement? Taxpayers know we will be paying for this, even those of us not on city sewer. The POCD, page 227, in the future of the city section states, all buildings, but especially those located in the walkable areas like downtowns near transit stations, and in neighborhood activity centers should incorporate basic principles of good city and neighborhood design that consider people first. The idea to develop around transit centers, village centers and jobs, the 15 minute city is great. So why not Rowayton? Because it's already gentrified? Considering people first means public health and safety for everyone, the ability to get to those in need in case of emergency, no matter the weather. This isn't possible on flooded roads. Today's Norwalk Hour article does mention that Norwalk PNZ considered public access, maintaining the maritime industry and improving water quality when it decided Water Street, aptly named, should be rezoned to CD5W. Our director said nothing about public health and safety absolutely nothing. For those leaders, city leaders and insiders who have been planning these zoning changes and working behind the scenes with developers, consultants and politicians for years, the news of having to plan for three feet of higher water in our coastal flood zone is highly inconvenient. The news that wetlands should not be filled if flooding is a concern is even more inconvenient. So redevelopment created a sustainability and resilience committee, more insiders, and suddenly sustainability and resilience features exist. And this is the good, the magic part. Now sustainability and resilience features will earn developers environmental points so they can build even bigger. So what if it is in a coastal flood zone? Does this logic make sense to you? 
ARC-POCD mentions building green infrastructure, rain gardens, using more solar energy and bike lanes in the new transit, transit districts. The POCD mentions using outside other outside consultants to study rezoning, which include a study which includes a study done about our waterfront. So how is it possible that Norwalk hired outside consultants and they didn't share what HUD has funded Circa and AECOM to tell our city leaders? Who are advising you in this epic decision? Utah did the study of the Norwalk waterfront zone, including Water Street, which is on the city website. Utile, and I hope I'm pronouncing it correctly, Utile, also worked closely with Portsmouth, New Hampshire, a waterfront city I know well. My father once ran the Portsmouth Naval Shipyard, an island in the Portsmouth Harbor. When I saw nothing substantial about rising water levels and stormwater management in the report, I called Utile and also spoke with local Portsmouth PNZ members who worked with the consultant. Utile, Utile, made it clear to me that they were told to not address rising sea levels or flood risk, rather to focus on how to develop around transit centers and create the 15 minute city. A consultant does what they are told to do, hired to do. Portsmouth PNZ members told me they hired the consultant for one reason, to get rid of their politically connected architectural review committee and to make way for large mixed use block-like buildings, which now cover the city. The consultant agreed with me that stormwater and stormwater management, flooding, and public health and safety were major concerns for Norwalk, but again, stressed that Norwalk hired them for a specific purpose. Do you really want some offshore, untraceable, LLC-owned mega yacht, which will pay the highest market price, taking over all the slips now available to Norwalk taxpayers on Water Street. Rezoning can bring many benefits, but when public health and safety is not the number one concern, then governments have failed constituents. Please ask more questions and think about the logic of letting the markets, the highest bidder own our waterfront, which is what a change from marine commercial to CD5W would do. Please think about our streets, flooding, and public health and safety. Thank you. Thank you. Jim Del Greco. Jim Del Greco. Evening, Jim Del Greco. I live at and own 41 Elmwood Avenue in the Golden Hill section of Norwalk. I have been a resident of South Norwalk since the dark days of the early 1980s when the area was not such a desirable place to live. I thank you for affording me five minutes of your time to address zoning rewrite regulations. And I also thank you for the time and effort that you put into all the work that you do. <clears throat> I am not informed enough about zoning regulations to be able to comment on the entire 500 page rewrite. So I will confine my comments to the initial decision that would have changed a portion of Golden Hill from C zone to CD4. In this initial decision, if this initial decision is any indication of the entire document, then either the rewrite needs more work or we need to stay with our current version of the zoning regulations. I stand against this rewrite unless the time is taken to make needed changes. I appreciate that we are in the preliminary phase of the process and that the zoning department has proven open to changes. So thank you for that. <clears throat> the stated goals of the rewrite, and I quote, are to prevent overcrowding, balance property rights, protect the most loved parts of the neighborhood, preserve unique neighborhoods, and incentivize historic preservation, end quote. The rewrite accomplishes none of these goals. In fact, the rewrite reverses decades of our work that have made our neighborhoods such desirable places to live. 
That is why we lobbied so forcefully to have CD4 changed to CD3 in parts of Golden Hill because the initial change would have totally altered our historic district in a very short period of time. Take my single family historic gem on the corner of Elmwood and Couch on a plot of land 120 feet by 112 feet. Not very big. Under CD4, the economic incentive to demolish the 170 year old house and 450 year old trees to build eight units is apparent. Eight units would be built with no setbacks from the street. This would change the entire look and feel <clears throat> of our Connecticut designated historic district and create a domino effect because so many of our properties are owned by seniors preparing to sell to new owners whose incentive to buy would be to profit from the increase in density. My concern is that this indicates that the broad brush zoning changes were not well thought out and if enacted will damage our city. Therefore, I suggest a slow down two-step process. First, focus on the rewrite language of the statues that everyone seems to agree is needed while keeping the current zoning designations. Once this rewrite is agreed to and enacted, then go through the laborious task of meeting with all parties in each area to find out the right mix and category. We are not against density when it is well thought out and communicated properly. Our housing diversity is what makes Norwalk a desirable city to live. The parking requirements of 1.3 spaces per dwelling unit and two spaces for single family is not based on reality. We live in a working city where multiple vehicles are a necessity to live and work. Every adult has at least one vehicle, if not multiple. Please tour our neighborhood, especially at night when people are home. You will be able to see for yourself the parking reality of overflowing driveways, parking in the front setback area, packed parked cars on the street and sidewalks violating no parking signs. The number of spaces per unit must be increased. Article eight of the rewrite concerns zoning enforcement and I quote a robust set of standards. The city and state can't enforce our current zoning regulations because their hands are tied. This, pre this preliminary proposal gives a green light to that fact and allows violators legal status. Please prove that the city can enforce current compliance before creating more problems for enforcement. <laughs> as for housing, as for the housing crisis and shortage in Connecticut, Norwalk over the decades has seen the addition of hundreds of new dwelling units. According to CTGov data, the population of Fairfield County will shrink from 917,000 in 2015 to 898,000 in 2030 and 905,000 in 2040. According to the 2021 census, Fairfield County's population grew by 40,000 from 2010 to 2021, but the years 2015, 16, 17, 18, 19, the population of Fairfield County either declined or was flat. It was only in 2020 and 2021 that the population grew by 1% and a half, or half a percent, which by all indicators was due to COVID flight. The rest of Connecticut actually saw a population decline of 14,000. Connecticut's population is heavily skewed towards seniors, which means more homes are becoming available for younger generations. I am concerned about the ramification of overbuilding an empty housing stock because of our declining population. It was not too long ago in the 80s when our town fathers were talking about the need to attract people to Norwalk to revitalize their city and housing stock. If it were not for an influx of immigrants, we would probably be having the same conversations. I hate to see all these huge buildings empty and a replay 
of the 1950s to 1990s. TPUDC told us to hold them accountable for their product. This document violates TPUDC's charge and goals. They should be held accountable. Please stand against this rewrite as is. Thank you for your time. Thank you. I think it's Ellen, Alice. Oh, Ellie, okay. Hello, I'm Ellen Bayless. I'm a real estate agent. I've worked in the commercial and residential markets for probably 40 years now. I've seen four. Can, can we have your address, please? Sure. 18 Starlight Drive in Norwalk. Thank you. We've built ourselves a mixed use building on Westport Avenue. We've seen developments that have taken place here in Norwalk for years that were done very carefully with a lot of consideration. We've got now a situation in these new regs that are stating that the parking has to now be behind commercial buildings along the US corridor. I don't know how you're going to implement that with all the parking in the front of these buildings. This is a monumental task. There's also pads that are in those parking lots, such as Wendy's, et cetera. This to me is just complete chaos. And the gentleman before me had said something very important that this is just gonna create more work for the city as well as for a lot of individuals who are in the real estate industry. Um, the other item that I want to discuss is uh, the density, which this gentleman just discussed. In the 40 years that I've been selling real estate, and I'm many generations now walk, we have found that there were four serious cycles. Those cycles were determined by demographics and the economy. In the case of the building of these apartments, Norwalk is no longer affordable. You've got one bedroom apartments that now are anywhere from $26 to $2,800. We have individuals who are single people that are coming to the community, trying to find an apartment for $2,000 or $1,800. It's not possible. Two bedroom apartments are now $3,000 to $4,000. And the idea to keep building buildings in order to make them affordable is ridiculous. You're going to, in a, in a few years, as this man had mentioned, the demographics are going to switch. You're going to have those individuals that are 55 to 70, 75, who are probably about 40% of those people that are renting right now in these luxury apartment buildings. You are also going to have those young people that are now professionals, 28, 29 year olds who are living in those apartment buildings, those newer apartment buildings, moving out of the town because of the school system and because of, because of they want a better quality of life. The only individuals that will be in there will be those that are transient, like we've seen before, some will be able to live there, but you're going to have to figure out what to do with these buildings that are now somewhat empty. And I'm, I know that back in the 80s, they built a number of condominium complex, complex. We had to figure out how to get rid of those condos when the market dropped. The FDIC came in, they took over the banks that had these mortgages, shut them down, happened again, in the 2000, 2007, 2008, the same cycle and the same situation. So I can only tell you that in your decisions to build density, you have to consider the fact that this will change again. And I'm only saying that you're gonna be left with buildings that you're gonna to have to figure out what to do. The only good news is that you probably could use them for assisted living houses because you know, you've got a baby boom generation right now that is saying I'm moving south 
I'm not going to stay in Connecticut because of the tax situation and the affordability. Um, the other item that I'd like to discuss is um, rear lots. We've got a number of rear lots that were grandfathered from the turn of the century. They're non-conforming. Folks have been living in these homes. I've sold a bunch of them in the past 10 years, 10, 20 years. And I can say that there's a problem with this because now they become non-conforming. What happens if those properties need an addition? You have to come to City Hall. They're non-conforming. What do you do with these people? I mean, they want to put an addition on, 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 the, uh, on the home. Um, I think that that's going to be a non-conforming issue. You've got all of US-1 that's going to be non-conforming now because the parking can no longer be in the front. It's got to be in the rear. So if, again, uh, let's say uh, Stop and Shop wants to put an addition on their property, now we have to reconfigure parking. You have to figure out how to do that in the rear of the building. Uh, same is true of most of the properties that are along here, including Marshall's. I mean, I could go on and on and on with what's on US-1. Uh, the other item that I want to talk about is the 50% rule. Uh, we've now gone, it's no longer the 50% rule, it's now the 25% rule with a 10-year reset. Most communities along Connecticut have now got 50% with a three to five year reset. What you're doing to most of the owners in Marvin Beach, Shorefront Park, Sable, Neptune, they're a wonderful, diverse community. And now these folks are going to have to figure out how to do any type of re repairs, replacement on barely anything. In some case, these people have maybe $20,000 to spend to do a new roof, new driveway, or a new HVAC system, HVAC system. And as we all know, those things are now probably 30, 40% higher than they were three or four years ago. I think that the consideration of this 50% rule has to be um, very seriously thought out. And I also think that um, with this whole development down at Wells Fargo, it seems really that the individual single family homeowner is now not considered as important as putting in 77 units down at the Mill Pond area. And I don't know how that got through, but I, and I don't want to go through that, but this has been, it's just a total, I, I, I think that all the pages that are in my briefcase right now, you've got a, a, the zoning regulations right now are about that high. We're, my brother, who's a commercial appraiser, he and I are going through a stack this high, page by page. The other thing I want to talk about is you're deciding on materials in what zone. You've, got, you've decided that C in C zone, there's no more vinyl siding. That's single family, and that is multifamily homes. So now what happens when that individual comes and wants to add a shed or an addition to the back of the property? Does he have to rip down the vinyl siding and put up cedar? What, what's the material? It seems ludicrous to me to make these changes when you're, you've got a tax reval year, you've got 45% increase in value in these homes. Those tax, those appraisals are going to come out in August, September, whenever their new tax bill is coming in January, and you're now restricting them with all of these guidelines, 700 pages, whatever it is, that and the 50% rule, you've got a perfect storm that you're all going to have to deal with. And it's not, I, I for one know that I'm going to be very busy taking care of situations where people now are unsure of what to do. How are they gonna sell their home? What's the complication? How much can they add on to a property that no longer is non-conforming in the rear, uh, in a rear lot? It's just ludicrous. I mean, I've, I've just never seen anything like this. Lastly, I'd like to say, my mother was on the last um, rewrite, so to speak, in the 80s. They did a, they, 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 
took a, a number of very educated people, whether it was in the, in the uh, real estate industry, in the legal industry, and they brought them in to City Hall and they worked on this for two years. And they did all kinds of tweaking to the zone, the new zoning that they were proposing. It worked very well. What you're doing is you're throwing out the baby with the bathwater, and this is just crazy. So thank you for listening. All right, next uh, we have Craig Flaherty. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yep. Yep. All right, great. Um, I'm here, uh, for the record, my name is Craig Flaherty. I'm a senior engineer and principal with Redness and Mead, a land use consulting company with offices in Stanford and Wilton. I am representing uh, my client, Harborview Norwalk LLC, uh, for which Bell Point Capital is the officer. They um, own or control 40 of the 44 dwelling units at 43 Harbor Avenue, uh, adjacent to the Waypoint uh, development blocks. I am largely here to highlight correspondence that we issued uh, as part of the public comment period. Uh, it's under Redness and Mead letterhead. It's dated June 15th. Uh, uh, commissioners are familiar uh, with our work. Um, so it is my hope that uh, you will find this document uh, and give it a read through. Uh, it is clear and concise. Um, I do two things uh, within the document. I talk specifically uh, about a request for 43 Harbor to be included in the CD5 district uh, to match the neighboring properties to the west and north. Um, but I also talk about some of the language in the CD5 district in general um, as it relates to height. Um, uh, I think I found some discrepancies where the author was trying to take a number of the, uh, the originating districts and the height regulations there and distill it into the new height regulations in the CD5. So I think there's some changes there. I've gone over that with uh, Steve Kleppen previously. Um, and I have uh, also looked at the uh, border between the proposed CD5 district where it abuts the proposed CD4 district, right? So your CD5 district right now is written uh, suggesting that uh, it could top out at eight stories. It might be less than that when you finally vote on it. Uh, whereas the CD4 district tops out at three and a half stories, that can be a stark um, transition. Um, so we're suggesting some language to provide a transition between the three and a half stories and the taller buildings in the CD5. Um, that transition would occur on the CD5 zoned lots. Um, so very specifically, um, I don't know if I'm able to uh, share my screen, um, Brian. All right, thank you. Um, so just a quick orientation. This is a snip of your proposed zoning map. The purple areas are proposed to be in the CD5 zone, largely what was the central business district today. Uh, pink areas are in the CD4 zone, uh, largely what was in the D residence zone today. Uh, so you see 43 Harbor here with the label. Um, it's immediately across the street from industrial zones, which will have a height allowance of four stories with some excess story to story height, given the industrial nature of the uses. Um, so that's bordering the property to the east and south, and then bordering the property to the west and north are those CD5 zones. Um, what is there today uh, are these homes built in 1945. 44, 44 of them uh, now approaching 80 years in age. Uh, they were uh, certainly constructed on a budget when uh, originally built and after 80 years are showing 
the signs of that age. So as uh, Bellpoint had originally started buying these units in 2015, uh, they had been thinking about redevelopment. And we're kind of in a between a rock and a hard place here. Had we done this last year, uh, we might have come to you with our own uh, application to be uh, considered for a zone change to the Central Business District. Uh, however, we were working on it this year, just when uh, your draft map changes and regulation changes were proposed. Uh, so we came in to see staff. Um, their counsel was that it would be difficult for the commission to consider kind of a one-off uh, zone change while you're considering these larger uh, planning concepts. Uh, so the suggestion was uh, we should participate in this process, which we are doing tonight, uh, and have you consider uh, the map change as a part of uh, the overall amendments that you're considering as a larger basis. Uh, likely, I mean, and, um, additionally, it was suggested that if we waited until you were done with this process and we came in immediately thereafter, you would say, well, you know, we just went through this big planning process. Uh, we don't know if we want to make any more changes at this point. So this is really our only outlet uh, to make this suggestion. Um, I don't think it's unreasonable to imagine that if we came in with an attractive building, uh, with an engaging streetscape, with the right uh, mix of public realm, open space and development spaces, uh, with the additional workforce housing units that could be created, uh, we could probably uh, convince you uh, that this would be a good project. And we've provided some very basic images of what that might look like in the letter uh, that I'm asking you to read. Um, uh, so um, the one of the major benefits of the change, I've got a chart in the letter, that looks at the workforce housing units created through the Waypoint District. So between what is built and operating, what is under construction at Pinnacle, uh, what is planned at Pacific House, and what is possible at Harborview, um, this six block area uh, will have totaled the creation of 144 workforce housing units. That's the public benefit side of uh, this uh, redevelopment and renewal of these aged properties um, in a smart way. Um, these are the exhibits that are included in a letter that look at, again, that boundary uh, between the CD5 zone and the CD4 zone um, with the suggestion that there be a height transition uh, written into the, the height regulations of the CD5. And we've additionally provided a suggestion uh, of what that language might look like um, to limit uh, uh, up to a height of three and a half stories within 50 feet of the CD4 zone. Um, uh, so that's all I have for tonight. Um, I thank you for your time uh, and do find this document uh, within the public comment materials uh, and give it your consideration as you are um, deciding what changes to make to the draft map and regulations over the next couple of months uh, to present in final form this fall. Thank you very much. Mr. Flaherty, uh, yes, sir. I suggest uh, you put your comments in writing. It was difficult uh, to follow everything you were saying. The acoustics uh, are not very good here. And okay. if you haven't already put it in writing to Mr. Kleppen, uh, yeah, there is a. There, a Strongly suggest you. We have it's in the it's been uploaded to the same okay. page. Um, next two speakers, I think it's Dan Russell and uh, Joe Kennedy, or last name is Russell. Oh, okay. Joe Joe Kennedy. Oh, okay. Joe Kennedy, please. And the next one is uh, David Bailey. Would be after. <clears throat> Thank you. <clears throat> My name is Joe Kendi. Uh, I live at 83 Weed Avenue in West Norwalk, AAA zoning, fifth taxing district. Uh, we don't have city garbage. Uh, we don't have uh, sewer. We do have water. Uh, at the time it was installed, we were told that uh, we had to seal up our wells. I thought that was a deprivation and taking my, my uh, property rights and frankly unconstitutional. 
Um, I'm very concerned with the consequences of uh, this decision, and I speak on behalf not only of AAA zoning, but AA, A, and B, any any single family uh, uh, neighborhood that, uh, regardless of the zoning designation, uh, the the direct consequence, in effect, is a deprivation of your property rights, uh, namely, apart from market value uh, fluctuations, uh, the value of your equity in your home, your return on your investment the quality in neighborhoods so eloquently spoken uh, tonight and last week about the effect on city services. I'm very concerned about environmental impact. I don't know if anybody's thought that through and really the effect on city services. And perhaps give you a little bit different perspective to think about as well. I used the phrase dep uh, dep deprivation of rights. And uh, you know, I was pleased to hear that the mayor opposed uh, this with respect to single family residences in all zoning categories. Uh, however, the fact of the matter is the mayor has no authority whatsoever over your decision. You're appointed by the mayor, approved by the council, there's a majority on the council, you're in office, that may change later. But if you enact this now, it's going to be very difficult, if not impossible, to change it. Okay. And <clears throat> there's no accountability, oversight, or uh, appeal process to your decisions. I think the authority of the Planning and Zoning Commission with respect to decisions like this one have to be reviewed and perhaps should be the subject of charter revision, referen referendum, I don't have the right answer, whatever it is. But the unilateral decision to affect individuals' property rights uh, and the value of their property, the quality of their neighborhoods is frankly just wrong. Yeah. I am David Bailey, 39 Brooklawn. Um, I just have two quick comments I wanted to make. And the first one is more like a, almost a, a visual object for you guys to think about. And it's, and I hope it illustrates what everybody's frustrated about. And if you can picture in your mind, a scale or a seesaw, on the one hand, you got quality. On the other hand, you got quantity. And that's what you're trying to balance here. And each one of us, when we go to buy our house, our single biggest investment, we weigh both those things. And everybody has different standards of what quality would be that they're, that's acceptable to them and what levels of quantity they're willing to put up with in terms of density of their neighborhood. We all made that decision. You all made that decision when you bought your houses. What everybody's frustrated about is that you're changing that balance without our input and without our say, and, and we're powerless to do anything about it other than just to voice our opinions which is what we're doing. And I appreciate that. I really do. I just hope it's really being considered because that's what this is about. That's what's frustrating for everybody. The other comment is more of a question that I'd like to put out to you and I hope it gets answered at some point. Um, I, I did attend the last meeting. I heard somebody make a comment that um, this isn't about winners and losers. Speaking of several of the areas that were originally rezoned to two family and then got backed off back to single family. Um, Bella's Garden, uh, Shorefront Park, and even parts of my neighborhood, Golden Hill. And um, I get that there's this, this standard that I think you're trying to apply in terms of uh, closeness or, or relative uh, distance to public transportation and, and, and also places of employment. If that's the standard, and you were applying that fairly and evenly across all neighborhoods, including Rowaiton, by the way, why is it... <laughs> Why is it that you would back away from some of these other neighborhoods? What did they have that we don't have? And make that apparent. So let us know what it was. The reason I say that is because every neighborhood has its unique characteristics. Every neighborhood has um, architecture that's worth preserving. Every neighborhood has a certain quality that we're talking about, quality of life. And I know you guys are saying that the property values do not get negatively impacted when this is done. And there's no evidence of that. And that's because, as somebody already pointed out, yes, if I have this big piece of property and I sell it and they can put in a multifamily house in there, yeah, they're going to be able to sell that for more. I, I get that. We're not. So let's not talk about property values as much as the quality of life that's in these neighborhoods. That's what will change. Because in, in a balance, you can have quality, you can have quantity, but you can't have them that we, we want them to be both. But if you em emphasize the quantity, the quality goes down, right? 
And if you emphasize the quality, then obviously there's going to be less density because people can't afford certain levels of quality. So that's just everybody understands that and knows that what you're trying to do is upset that balance that's already out there. So the second comment, I would just say, uh, please explain to us why some neighborhoods uh, were backed away from being upside up zoned. And if you're looking for more space, I believe Lockwood Mansion has a lot of space and you can put some people in there. That's all I have to say. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Nancy Simica. Hi, my name is Nancy Skemica, and I live at 43 Seaview Avenue in East Norwalk. Um, my family has been in East Norwalk for over 100 years. Um, we've been on um, two parcels in, for over 75 years on Seaview Avenue, and I personally have been on Seaview Avenue for 60 years. Um, I'm speaking today for at least six residents of 43 and 45 Seaview Avenue. I'd like to express my strong opposition to changing the current C and D residential multifamily zoned Seaview Avenue, which is currently most of Seaview Avenue, to being changed to the proposed CD4W, which is defined as General Urban Water Community District. I am a layman trying, I'm a layman trying to figure out what this all means. So I'm happy to hear um, we have the summer to learn more about these proposed changes. Under the proposed CD4W zoning, there are many changes being proposed, such as allowing for shop fronts on houses, dining yards, commercial porches, bed and breakfasts, hotel, hotels, inns, government agencies, theaters, retail sales, amphitheaters, and many more on Seaview Avenue. One, one reason given for the zoning changes is to simplify the zoning. This residential street does not fit into the CDW4W model. It also looks like other surrounding streets to Seaview will also be changed to CD4W, which includes Beth's Place, Cottage Street, Osborne Avenue, Good Row, Harvey Street, and the residential end of East Avenue, which is about a total of 120 parcels. Seaview Avenue is in jeopardy of being turned into a commercial area. These proposed changes completely disregard the quality of life of the residents who live here and who would suffer from the increased noise, traffic, unknown tax impact, parking issues, safety issues, um, adver advertising signs on houses, um, customers day and night, and so forth. I'd like to, um, I'd like, you to ask yourself if you purchased a home in a residential area for you and your family, would you like it to change to a commercial zone or a downtown area? Um, so that was one, one issue I wanted to talk about. And then also um, the park, the park on Seaview Avenue. Um, so we're also opposed to Veterans Memorial Park on Seaview Avenue being rezoned to um, a CV zoning for Civic. Um, in the name of simplification, Veterans Memorial Park is being grouped into a one-size-fits-all CV zone. At the beginning of the 20th century, the residents of Seaview Avenue deeded their land that is now Veterans Memorial Park over to the city with that express purpose of the land forever, forevermore be used for park purposes. Since that time, there have been various attempts to forget this generosity and these restrictions, including attempts to develop commercial heliports, which I have a letter from my grandfather from 1958 asking that they not put a heliport across from our house. Um, Carnival-like miniature golf courses, which the neighbors fought also. Um, commercial amphitheaters and more. Some um, of the allowed uses in the proposed CV zoning are yet another attempt to violate the letter and spirit of these agreements. Um, the list of permitted uses in CV zone include railroad stations, municipal parking garages, public utility storage spaces, and many other uses, which would be a stretch to consider for park purposes. Worse yet are proposed uh, are proposals to extend Vets Park hours, possibly 24 hours um, or till 2 a.m. on the east end of the park, um, leaving the park open. Um, is explicitly to support commercial activity in the area. Um, fundamentally, we're, this is fundamentally at odds with how the property was deeded to the city for park purposes. Unrestricted CV zoning must not be allowed for Veterans Park. Further, up until about 2002, when the city installed speed bumps and started closing the park at around 9 a.m., 
the residents of um, what, what is that? PM. 9 p.m. Um, prior to that, the residents of Seaview Avenue had been subjected to very late night activity in the park, including drag racing with flags, <laughs> multi-car parties, cars parked on Seaview Avenue being totaled um, as people left the park um, at late night parties. We had six of them totaled in front of our house, our own cars, and we no longer park in front of our house. The noise and illegal activities were unbearable and it was left to the residents re to report it to the police late into the night. This all stopped at a reasonable hour when the park was routinely closed at dusk and the cars and people were made to leave the park at dusk or around nine o'clock. Um, going backwards and repeating history would have an outsized impact on our family, and I'm sure many others on Seaview, um, which now includes, and now I have a severely disabled son who really is affected by the noise going on in the park, especially if they leave it open all night. Um, please keep this a safe and residential neighborhood like you would want for your neighborhoods. And that's it. Thank you. Thank you for listening. Uh, first speaker, Reed Auerbach. Second one is Patricia, I'm apologizing in advance, Tacarello. Hi, Reed Auerbach. I live at Two Roland Avenue in East Norwalk. My family home I grew up in and lived in for almost 70 years. I want to thank the zoning department for taking on this very difficult task of updating zoning in Norwalk. I attended Norwalk schools, Old Marvin School on Gregory Boulevard, Nathan Hale in this beautiful building, Old Norwalk High, class of 66. I want to talk about something I know a little bit about, one of the resources we don't talk about much. This past January, I retired from the Norwalk Fire Department after 44 years of service as a fire captain. 90% of our calls now are medical, heart attacks, difficulty breathing, diabetic issues, and so on. Many times we have to wait for ambulances from surrounding towns, Darien, Wilton or beyond as local medics are on other calls. Thank God for our dedicated police, fire, and EMS personnel. More and more residents with no additional personnel will strain the system like any other resource. From personal experience, the amount of illegal apartments unenforced may have 10 to 20, 10 to, uh, eight to 10 people living there, more strain on the system. Do any of you live in East Norwalk, by the way? Anybody on the board? I didn't think so. Anna does, by the way. As an East Norwalk resident, I deal with a traffic nightmare every day, taking up 15 to 20 minutes to get from mobile gas station on Winfield Street to I-95. We don't need or can absorb an additional 1,000 to 1,500 apartments, no matter how you try and rationalize it. Ludlow Manor is one of the streets stated to change from family, from one family to two family zoning. A street that has been invested in by residents, homeowners, and single family, um, as a single family street. Making these changes will uh, not promote affordable housing. Two family zone will simply allow investors to purchase two family properties and benefit from middle-class families and young professionals with top rents, which will only further them from home ownership goals in the future. Please keep single family, single family. For the past 15 years, I've been a commercial real estate broker. I understand development. I'm not against development. We need smart development, but careful consideration to balance density and growth. I would hope that each one of you will go home tonight, look in the mirror and your heart and ask yourself, am I doing what is best? And most importantly, am I doing what Norg residents want for our beautiful city? because it seems to me you're more concerned about people who don't even live here. I right, thank you. My name is Patricia Tagariello. I live at 11 Roger Square, which is the address for senior living. Uh, we've been affected by traffic. It's been brutal by us. People think our street, Roger Square, is a shortcut around all the traffic stuck on East Avenue, and they're flying to our parking lots. We have people walking around with walkers, and that's the only part of the area they can walk in. Everything else has been taken away. So uh, 
adding more housing with 70 families, and that means probably 150 more cars. It's unbelievable. There is, I mean, something's got to be done. When we, when we call for an ambulance, we get the fire engine, we get the police car, and we get the ambulance. They have a hard time coming in sometimes. They can't, they have to move cars and whatnot, and it's only going to make it worse. There's, we are a congregate building, and we are the same as the Marvin, which is going probably through the same thing themselves down there uh, on Gregory. And also we have another senior place, which is uh, on Strawberry Hill, which is assisted living. And, uh, you know, the, uh, it seems that the seniors have been quiet, but I'm going to be here talking for them because it's, you know, it's, I walk, I walk to the beach a lot and it's dangerous. It really is. Cars go flying, racing, the, um, uh, the bike lane, forget it. You'd be dead if you ride in it. It's terrible. And then you are going to add more cars and more. It just doesn't make sense. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, we have Diana Palladino and looks like Jason Christopher. Hi, can you hear me? Yes, we can. Uh, yes, my name is Diana Palladino. Christopher, um, it's just me, um, One Naples Avenue. Um, I don't have anything prepared, but I did feel it was important uh, to speak. Um, my husband and I are both lifelong Norwalk residents. Um, I know we hear this a lot, but it's so special. Um, we have generations of Norwalkers um, who have invested in this city um, time and time again. And I hear stories of the Norwalk that once was, and Norwalk was like a town. And yes, it was, but now it's a city and I'm proud of that um, as so many of us are. And um, I really believe that Norwalk is, uh, has so much to offer. Um, we've conformed with the times and we've grown into something truly unique um, in my opinion, like no other. Um, just in my 40 years, I've seen so much change, mostly for the better. And as a result, we've worked really hard to stay here. Uh, in my late 20s and early 30s, the best of friends moved further north to raise families, purchase homes. Um, it was definitely easier. Um, for us, it was a bit harder, but we chose to stay because we love the diversity, the coastal amenities, um, you know, just minutes from our doorstep, um, the great restaurants, the stores, the entertainment. Um, but at the same time, we have the ability as a family of five to choose to go back to our somewhat quaint and quiet neighborhood after a day at the beach or shopping um, or having a meal out with the kids on a Saturday night. Um, Norwalk really is the best of both worlds, but quality of life, especially in East Norwalk, um, can be frustrating at times. Um, we've dealt with drag racing, uh, traffic woes, um, you know, resident beach access, uh, denial on the 4th of July, um, increased street parking, and um, it's very frustrating. And um, I'm happy to have a neighborhood that we can come home. We sit in our backyard, we enjoy the company of great neighbors. Um, the kids ride their bikes on the street, play basketball at the end of the driveway. Um, but I really wanna keep it that way. Um, I understand we need to grow, but I don't believe that growth always has to mean increasing density. And it's so much more than that. Growth is investing in the people that are already here in the residents and ensuring that we create a community that people want to live, work, and invest in. Uh, neighborhoods are really the heart of a community, in my opinion. Um, and one of the things that stands out to me the most with this proposal has been the narrative on affordable housing. Um, more apartments, townhome, townhomes, and one-family zoning um, being made into two-family zoning. Um, I truly don't believe that it will encourage home ownership. I think it's a misconception. Uh, Two-family housing will likely profit an investor. 
Um, it's unlikely that a middle-class family trying to build a life here will benefit from that line of thinking. Um, we see that with the $2,300 a month uh, rents for studios and, uh, you know, houses can, you know, rent for an upwards of 3,000 plus um, and then some per month. And that's not going to benefit the middle class families and young people just starting out. That's only going to further them away from home ownership. Um, so I hope that you guys will consider the concerns of our neighborhoods. I've worked too hard. I want to stay here. I'm continually excited about raising my kids here. We love NPS. Um, I know their future in Norwalk will be just as special as it's been to me. And I hope someday that they'll choose to uh, live in Norwalk and build a future here. And I hope that we can uh, protect our incredibly unique neighborhoods. Uh, neighborhoods uh, create informed communities. And um, Norwalk is a melting pot of various neighborhoods and great history. So thank you. Thank you. Jim Henderson, and then second speaker is Mary Beth Sullivan. I spoke at the last meeting of the Okay, Mary Beth, and then Sally Kellogg. Hi, my name is Mary Beth Sullivan. I live at 42 Harbor View in South Norwalk. I've been here a long time, 30 plus years. I'm also a real estate agent for William Ravis. So I, first of all, just want to comment that uh, you have a huge task in front of you. Um, I certainly could never get through that 100, 800 pages. So I'm glad that a lot of people here are actually doing that hard work. But I think uh, so many things are interrelated and um, the impacts have to be very thought out because as somebody mentioned, once these changes are in place, they're in place. So I am only here to talk about a little piece of the um, regulations, and that's to do with the 50%, the substantial improvement. I live in a VE zone and have for 30 years, so I know all about water and storms, and I continue to live there, and I'm very happy where I am. And um, I deal, because of my real estate business, I have um, worked with a lot of clients in buying and selling, non-FEMA compliant homes, hence my concerns with the substantial improvement. Um, not, oh, Norwalk has the most restrictive rules and regulations <clears throat> as it relates to that subject. Um, they currently have it and the proposed is just as, you know, maybe not as restrictive, but very restrictive. And, and if you compare all the towns around us, you know, we're all concerned about safety. We understand about environmental concerns, you know, but I think all the surrounding towns, including FEMA itself, I mean, I'm not quite sure I really understand why we need to be more restrictive than FEMA itself, since they are really dealing with the consequences of this regulations as it relates to flooding and reimbursing you know, from insurance. So I'm not, I don't really understand where we, why we are where we are. I've dealt with properties in Darien and Westport and their rules and regulations are very simply stated, very simply stated. I've worked with planning and zoning for some time talking about this issue. Um, I was in a meeting with uh, Rilling and Lou because I, I really feel that the story goes like this in all the other towns, that the substantial improvement is 50% of the current market value. And it resets, as Ellie so eloquently talked about, every three to five years. And with that, people then, in their homes they've lived for a very long time, just want to replace the kitchen. The budget of a 10-year look back and 25% is first of all, I think very arbitrary, and second of all, um, not very wise. And I think the goal of all of us is in real estate, homeowners, you know, just about everybody is to get to FEMA compliancy. But I think there's an organic way to do that because I had a client moved into non-FEMA 
compliant home. He says, do I have to raise it? And I said, no, you can do some minor modifications. And then he calls me five years later and says, well, now I want to do this, do that, do this, do that. And I said, oh, okay. So now it's time to protect your investment and raise your house. So I think that natural progression just happens. And so I really would like you all to really think on how you're impacting a large swath of our community. Not only, I, I live in Harborview, but you know, there's a lot of places that live on streams and brooks and everybody's affected by this rule. And I really don't understand the motivation. I, we're all for safety. We're all for that end goal to come to FEMA compliancy, but you're really handicapping, you know, people who are trying to replace a roof. A lift for a house is probably close to $200,000 these days. So it's not a, a small item to add to a budget when you're trying to replace a roof or windows or want a new kitchen. So. Darien, Westport, Stamford, I, I could go on and on and on. It's very simple. There are rules and regulations. I have them right here that it's 50% of the current market value and it resets every three to five years. Simply put, understandable, and it just seems to work well. And I don't know why it can't work for Norwalk. So I'd really like for you to understand it. I unfortunately, um, wanted to have a, a petition or some more signatures because unfortunately, there's so many people in Norwalk that really don't know all these rules and regs. I mean, a lot of people are unaware of some of the changes. I mean, obviously everybody here, we're preaching to the choir because these people are on top of what's happening with the rules and regulations that are proposed. But there's so many people who just are unaware, not because they're not educated, they don't have the time, they didn't, haven't heard about it, blah, 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 blah. So you will be hearing from me with a, um, a list. I actually designed a petition, but found out, thanks to Tammy, that I needed the addresses and the um, software I was using didn't provide for that. So I am gathering information for people to make their voices heard to you, because I know a lot of people who um, agree with me that there's a way to change our regulations to work for everybody. So thanks for your time. And you have a very large task in front of you to make this all work for Norwalk. So, and I know you're all volunteers, so time is a premium that you give to all of us. But I think that I've heard from a couple of people too that if in fact you're not ready to make the, the major decisions that these rules and regulations are going to have impact for so many years down the road, that to take your time, you know, it doesn't have to be done by October, November. I mean, I'm all for getting this all together, but there's some really valid concerns that you all need to understand all the impacts. And I don't know how you do that, but good luck. <laughs> Listen to all of us, thank you. Hi, my name is Sally Kellogg. I live at 4 Lewis Street, Norwalk, Connecticut. Um, I'm a 14th generation Kellogg. My grandfather, my great great was uh, Daniel Kellogg, who was one of the founding fathers of Norwalk. So when I bought my house, I was really very excited about looking up information in the historical community and, and finding things in town hall that reflected things about my family. When I started working on my house, um, it's in an antique area right near the green and the complications of being in an antique house and in the in that green area um, sort of brought me to the meeting today because I, I agree with what everybody's saying. I, I made a lot of notes. I have a background in architecture. I have an NCIDQ credential in interior design so I can work on hospitals or Fisher Price Toy Research Center, amphitheaters, stadiums, that sort of thing. Um, and so I understand design quite well, and I understand what it takes to make a community. And when you see what people are complaining about with the community being um, changed without their consent and without their um, provision, I have to say that I go back to, I, I made a lot of notes 
that confirm exactly everything that people have been saying and about the fiber of the communities. But one thing that I find really um, problematic with Norwalk in general is that there is no plot map or plat map um, of the city. And so I would come into town hall and I would try and talk to people about the property that I purchased. And some people would say, well, you go to the assessor's map. Other people would say, you go to the deeds and you follow the deeds to make sure that that property is yours. Well, there is no plot map or plat map. So as a homeowner, I'm forced to go file and get a very expensive survey to create my own first survey of a property that was handed down from generation to generation from 1844 until I bought it in 2002. Now, if you do that with every single one of these properties that you want to change from single family to double to double occupancy or two family, the next thing you know is you're going to have a war on your hands with every single person who tries to get a survey that doesn't match up to somebody else's survey because the survey people are putting down their impression of what they think it is, but it's not necessarily matching up to an assessor's map or a plot map. So my recommendation would be before you start changing all of these different zones and areas that you sit down and you go point by point, every single property, and you make sure where those property lines really are. And you put together a plot map of that area of all of those properties before you make a change. And, and because if someone comes in and invests in my, my next door neighbor's house, and he doesn't care, he's not my neighbor, he just invests in that and he wants to do whatever he wants. He gets a survey, he pushes me out of the way, I have to push back, then we're all in court. And so it just creates this big mess of people trying to say, no, that's mine, no, it's my property. And this is something wars are started over, you know, when people are thrown out of their homes and like ran off the, the uh, Yugoslavian border and things like that. And so I think, I think it's something that's much more serious than just by saying with a stroke of a pen, we're gonna change all of these buildings from one type of zoning to another type of zoning. And I think that's the most important thing is to kind of back that up and realize the impact of what that's gonna to do to the borders of each and every one of those particular properties that you're trying to change in the commercial zones as well as the residential zones too. Thank you. Thank you. Next is Steve Alcesta. Steve, you just have to unmute yourself. It should be at the bottom of your screen. Steve, we can come back to you. I see Douglas Peoples has his hands, hand back up. Let's see if Doug can. Doug, you just have to unmute yourself. You want me to come back to them, Brian? I can do that after. Uh, yeah, it's a, Doug, you unmuted. Can we? Can you try talking? See if we can hear you. Can you hear me now? Yeah. Yes, oh, thank God. <laughs> so uh, my name is Doug Peoples. I'm at 25 Pogany Street. Um, as many of our previous speakers, like Teddy and I, grew up in Norwalk, born and raised. Um, I grew up in Colonial Village, all right, a project. My goal was to get across town and hang out with my guys that I played baseball with in East Norwalk because that's the kind of town we have in Norwalk, a diverse community. And you guys are thinking about putting two, two family um, dwellings in a community that has um, seen a great deal of, of growth. No need for two family. No need at all. 
You're already changed, changing the the structure of East Norwalk by knocking down the bank and putting in ridiculous numbers of condominiums. Once you go around, once you go around the, the graveyard there and you put in those condominiums, you have lost the fabric of East Norwalk. It no longer exists. I can tell you now how this all started with our building is with the gentleman, and I'm glad I, I got muted the first time because then the gentleman from Waypoint came on. And he showed you a map. He showed you what he wants to do. He wants to knock down and displace everybody at the Carver Apartments. And the Carver Apartments now will not exist. And the people who are now a part of the Carver Apartments will no longer be able to afford those $2,000 rents that um, they propose to have. And God bless a guy like Tim Curry, who held out from Waypoint, from eminent domain of taking his building, because now we still have that staple in the community Curry's tire because he fought his butt off to to save his his establishment from eminent domain. And when you when they talk about workforce, workforce is just another way of saying, hey, we're going to let some people live here for a while. But when they start making big money, we're going to shove them out so that we can get the, the market rent. So that word workforce um, doesn't mean what it, really, what it really is. Now, if you're talking about building that 200 unit building in South Norwalk, and it's going to house the people from South Norwalk that can afford to live there and stay there, not for one, not for two, not for three years, but five years plus, then that's the type of building that we need so that young men and young women can stay in this town. Right now, they can't stay here. Right now, they, they cannot be a part of this community. Norwalk is one of the best diverse communities in the state of Connecticut. We have the best group of people that I've grown up with and respect in Norwalk for years and years and years. Now, when you start displacing people by putting in two, two, two units in a, in a residential area, it doesn't work. That's no longer Norwalk. Now we just got to name, rename ourselves to Stanford Junior. All right, we don't want to be Stanford, and everybody keeps shoving us towards Stanford. We want to be that nice city that looks like a community. So, all I'm asking you guys to do is reconsider what you've all, what everybody said today. I can't say it again because everybody is saying between last week and this week, everybody is saying, don't do it, put the brakes on. Reconsider. Go a different route. Keep Norwalk as Norwalk. We do not want to be Stanford, period. First speaker, Regina Flaherty, followed by Julie Fleming. Good evening, everyone. Uh, this I'm Regina Flaherty, and I live at 17 Cripplewood Lane, which is off of East Rocks Road. And that is part of an area where there is um, mostly one acre um, lots that have very few, um, there's no sewers there, so it's all septic. But I'm really here to talk more about my mother's house, which is off of Dry Hill Road. And then that is a location where we are doing 
a change of zone where we're going to permit two family um, homes. Right now, it's all one family, single family zoning. The property, the house she lives in was built in 1930, right after the zoning laws in Norwalk were passed. And it's been single family ever since. So I would encourage you to look back. And I thought that the um, description that was uh, offered on the website of what happened with the zones was that the B zone, which is what uh, Dry Hill Road and Merrill Road is currently zoned, the B zone was similar to some other zones. And so we put it all together and it just so happened that two family were permitted in the other zones. So I would suggest that maybe we could create another zone because we've gone from 31 zones down to 14, just make a 15th zone and put the B zone back where it was and make it single family again. Um, so I, I encourage you to think about that. And I also think that part of um, my concern is that zoning is supposed to be preserving the character of a community. And I think that's what the theme of so many people who've spoken before, that we do want to preserve the character of this community. And when I went on to the website for Norwalk, the first thing that greeted me was, we are one of the 100 most livable cities. We're number one in certain, in certain lists of a wonderful place to be. And I don't think we want to change that. And I think that that's been the goal of planning and zoning is to enhance it. And so to the extent that we can enhance it with increasing the value of the school system, increasing infrastructure to deal with some of the, the uh, parking issues and the traffic issues people are talking about, making sure we have sufficient sewer, water, school systems that's going to support any increase in density. All those are part of what the Planning and Zoning Commission does. So I know you have a very difficult job and I would just encourage you to think about whether there's a compelling reason that we have to change the zones or if we can go and have some kind of balance. So thank you. Thank you. Hi everyone, uh, my name is Julie Fleming. I'm at One Arrowhead Court. Um, I live in the Cranberry neighborhood, so I'm not directly affected by the zoning change. Um, I wanted to start by just thanking the committee for the work on the zoning regulation updates. Um, so someone who has perused the existing zoning regulations, I do appreciate that the revised document structure um, and the content is much easier for a lay person to follow. Uh, secondly, I just want to register my opposition to the upzoning of single family neighborhoods to two family neighborhoods. Um, I am concerned about how increasing Norwalk's density by crowding out single family homes will affect our city's infrastructure and also the systems that support the high quality of life that we're all so proud of, including the 100 list that was just mentioned. Um, I'm particularly concerned about how increasing density in Norwalk will affect our ability to adequately fund our schools, especially as our high need student population continues to grow. Will upzoning single family homes bring in substantially more property tax revenue or will the painful annual debates about whether school counselors, social workers and middle school sports are wants versus need in light of our budget challenges be even further exacerbated? Finally, I'm concerned about this change because it represents a break in the contract between home buyer and city government. Neighbors who purchased a home, a home in a single family neighborhood bought that home because it fit their wants, needs and expectations. If they had wanted to live in a multifamily neighborhood, they would have purchased a home in a multifamily zone. We should be listening to our neighbors about what they want in their neighborhood. And what I'm hearing is that change is unwanted. Which brings me to my last point, a little bit different, um, which is that I thoroughly oppose the provision in the proposed zoning regulations that allows bed and breakfast establishments in single family neighborhoods as a principal use as of right, including presumably Airbnbs. I would venture a guess that no purchaser of a single family home in Norwalk dreams that their neighbor will begin operating a small hotel next door with or without breakfast. Of course, when we hear the words bed and breakfast, we all get cozy pictures in our heads of lovely house guests who enjoy quietly reading Pride and Prejudice over their morning coffee before heading out to the local farmer's market, not a house full of New York City residents who are ecstatic to enjoy a backyard pool party in the suburbs all weekend. But all that is legally required per the zoning code is owner occupancy and breakfast. So a basket of Pop-Tarts and an owner who is occasionally present enough to evade enforcement will suffice. I'm going to go ahead and come out as a complete NIMBY 
on the possibility of a Pop-Tart hotel and eternal pool party next door. And I think most single family homeowners in Norwalk will agree with me, whether private or commercial, a bed and breakfast provides no added value to a residential single family neighborhood, but it does provide a whole host of potential headaches, including increased noise, traffic, and the insecurity of not knowing who is hanging out next door from one day to the next. Please remove this from our zoning code. And I thank you again for your time, um, your willingness to listen and your work on this committee. Thanks. Thank Next is Bob Coppola. Yes, good evening, how are you? Okay, I'm listening to all these uh, comments today. I don't have any data, but I'm gonna give you my opinion. Uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Coppola, uh, can we have your uh, name and address, please? Yes, my name is Robert Coppola. I'm on 237 Strawberry Hill Avenue in Norwalk. Thank you. Okay. So, you know, you make a comment I saw on the website, no impact on density. I, I, I don't know what that means, but if you're gonna have, uh, I'm in a single family development right now that will become available for two. So I would assume that you could uh, maybe not double, but maybe increase that, that uh, livability. And therefore, I, I think that would be an impact on number one, the school system. Uh, number one, on the water supply and the sewer treatment. People mentioned this in previous conversations. Uh, not only uh, parking, I heard parking over and over. Parking is a nightmare. On my street, I drive up and down here. I've been here for 40 years, 40 plus years. Parking is incredible on Strawberry Hill Avenue. It was never like this before. And even some of the side streets like Heather Lane, You'd be lucky you get a fire truck through those areas in the emergency. Parking on both sides road with signs saying no parking. Uh, Pedham Road, that's another example. We have friends up there. You can't even get to that, that street without parking on both sides. I don't know if there's, there's multiple living now, but if you double that, you'll need a parking garage. Uh, that's what I have to say. I'm saying I'm worried about the infrastructure. I'm worried about the strain on schools, the water supply, the treatment capability, parking, the density. That's what I'm worried about. Thank you. I, I, I... Is there a Marjorie? Hi, good evening. My name is Marjorie Madden, and I'm a very unlikely speaker here tonight because I live in Broad River. Um, and if those of you that don't know, it's mixed use, single family, uh, two family, multifamily, and of course, our beloved SROs. Um, I can't understand why a large percentage of the residents park on the street, we're allowed. All homes have driveways, but the single lane driveways, I guess they just don't want to jockey the cars in and out. We have multiple combo registration vehicles, which are trucks mostly used for construction that are allowed due to the combo registration of the vehicle. So unless they're going to require double wide driveways with each two family, it will be a disaster. Some of the newer two families have created six plus parking spaces covering the front of their property. Not a great look. So the former permeable surfaces now run off to neighbors' yards, creating flooding. For larger lots, I suppose it wouldn't be a problem. Or now I should mention snow plowing and street cleaning. Snow plowing in my neighborhood is a mess because the cars parked on the street do not move for the snow plows. And street cleaning, <laughs> it's non-existent. They don't move for that either. There are apparently are no statues regarding how long you can leave your car on the street in our sing multifamily, single family area. Some cars have been in the same spot for a year. There are weeds growing around, under, and not to mention small animals have now taken up residence. 
When I got out of college after growing up in Greenwich, Connecticut, I realized that running in Greenwich, that was beyond my resources. Did I feel that Greenwich was responsible for housing me? Hell no. I found an apartment up the line and it was great. Norwalk has done more for seniors, low income, affordable than any surrounding town. Nor <laughs> Norwalk should not feel pressured to adopt two family housing in single family neighborhoods. Just because someone says it doesn't mean you have to do it. It's not going to do what you think in creating home ownership. It's just going to be more rental units. In my area in Broad River, I walked around, there is one owner occupied two family. All the others, they're all investors and their rentals. The person buying a home and converting it to a two family is gonna be an investor. The regular home buyer would never have the resources. The average conversion cost is 80 to 100,000 nationally and Fairfield County would probably be considerably higher. Also, if this home is torn down and rebuilt as a two family, it will be very apparent in the neighborhood as the home will be much higher than the current homes in the neighborhood. The square footage will be pushed to the zoning max in height and percentage of lot area covered. Homes torn down and rebuilt as two family homes will in all probability be investors who have done this many times before. Some of our plots where I live are the same size as in Rowayton. Are our neighborhoods not as near and dear as Rowayton? Please save the single family neighborhoods in Norwalk that the residents have nurtured. Thank you. Thank you. If there are uh, any speakers uh, on Zoom that wish to speak, you can use the raise your hand function at the bottom of the screen. If you're on a phone, star nine. Um, I'll take the next two here. Eric, is it Eric Diaz? I'd like to thank the committee. Uh, also, uh, I'm not gonna rehash too much stuff. The overwhelming response from the people that live in these neighborhoods has been uh, against rezoning one family to two family. I'm also opposed to this. My primary concern being the transfer from owner occupied to non Norwalk corporate owners offering rentals. Uh, as some have mentioned, it's not an abstraction. We've seen that in practice. I also wanted to mention that the support I heard at the last meeting for these measures was a little distressing. Uh, after some odd asides about bike lanes, it was advocacy for the collapse of our neighborhood so they could buy on the cheap. Uh, my street is primarily working class families. So to quote kind of dubious national studies from Zillow or the National Renters and uh, Developers Association, when adjudicating a terrifically local issue seems a little bit silly. To root for the decimation of the principal asset of working class families seems craven and to suggest that neighborhoods take actions likely to degrade their own cohesion for these individual self-interest uh, to my mind was diluted. So I just wanted to say that everyone who lives in these neighborhoods or the overwhelming majority, I should say, of people who live in these neighborhoods are against these measures. Thank you. Thank you. Je Jesse McCarty. Hello everyone, I'm Jesse McCarty and I live at 10 Branford Street. I'll speak mostly tonight about East Norwalk because I live there, but much of what I'm about to say applies to anywhere in Norwalk. And I do wanna say I appreciate, the, appreciate those from the Shorehaven area that spoke last week, um, even though they now seemed <laughs> deemed safe, but it was appreciated that they gave us their support. Um, I'll, it's a long day. I'll get right to it. And I'm going to try and skim over the topics that so many people have touched on. I'll be, I'll be quick, I promise. I am against, surprise, <laughs> against upzoning. Property values going down, quality of life, more people, more noise. 
Renters not invested in the upkeep of properties. Public schools impacted. Teacher to student ratio is already bad. Watershed issues, significantly more traffic congestion, and not just for those who live and or work in East Norwalk, but for anyone going to the beach or that area, this is really not good. Parking shortages, folks spoke about that quite a bit, but I have not heard anyone mention that when there's a parking so shortage, um, many owners will pave a good section of their property to make room for cars and including their setbacks. So little by little, the beautiful New England greenery that we enjoy on, on the street will disappear. Start to look like Queens, New York. I'm from there, I know. I also just don't believe that this is gonna make housing affordable. I just don't. Uh, just a place for investors to make money like so many others have said, please listen to them. For example, in East Norwalk alone, in just the last few years, 189 luxury apartments at Brim and Crown, 77 luxury apartments are coming to the loft at Mill Pond, 11 luxury condos on Winfield Street, and 84 EVTZ parcels along East Avenue with up to 1,100 luxury apartments could happen easily. So when does the density stop? And that's all before this conversion of single to multifamily housing. And as was just mentioned a few minutes ago, that also permits for bed and breakfast establishments. No, thank you, but I'll take the Pop-Tarts. And long day, I get punchy. <laughs> And maybe most importantly, which is a point that was also brought up, but most definitely worth repeating, we specifically chose the part of Norwalk we want to live in, the type of block we want to live on, the type of neighborhood. And many of us have invested our life savings. And we have raised children. We love where we live. And we have the right to keep what we paid for. Short-term renters, and they are inevitable, cannot be invested in the same way. They just can't. So for those reasons and so many more that others have mentioned, I say that this is a step in the wrong direction for our beloved Norwalk. And I have an important question to ask, um, but before I do, I have to backtrack a little bit. So please give me a little leeway. It's not that much. Hate saying this, but here we go. I, like so many others here and watching today via Zoom, have attended multiple meetings with Planning and Zoning Commission regarding so many changes to Norwalk. Many on Zoom, and before that, we did the same thing in person. I willingly participated in lengthy PNC presentations and workshops where my opinion was asked about everything from density to building heights and architectural details regarding the transit-oriented district, which most in East Norwalk didn't even want at all and still don't, but we were grateful to be involved and hoped that our suggestions would be taken seriously and that most would be applied. After all, we live here and we know what works and what doesn't. That didn't happen. EVTC, Winfield Street, and particularly one Cemetery Street developments. Endless meetings, emails, PowerPoint presentations. Residents stressed in every way possible that increased density of this magnitude and setting a precedent for future growth, upzoning, comes with a host of problems and that bonus points amenities in, will in no way make up for these problematic issues. There was even a last minute petition signed by over 700 residents in Norwalk objecting to that special permit. Our suggestion was simply to scale back the plan as a mean of a reasonable compromise. After all, we live here. We know what works and what doesn't. That didn't happen. So here's my question to all of the commissioners, but 
particularly to you, Mr. Kleppen, if you could get off your phone. I'm listening. Go ahead. Not a good look. Respectfully, I cannot say that word strongly enough. Respectfully, I do respect the time and energy that you put into this commission. What will it take for you to at least say no to upzoning of single family houses to two or more family houses? No dancing around the answer by saying, I, I need to consult with this one or that one or the other one. Quite simply, exactly what needs to happen for you to say, we will absolutely positively guarantee not to upzone single family houses to two or more family houses. Can you please tell us all that? We'll make it happen. What do we do? Respectfully, again, I mean that truly. I hope we get the answer soon. Thank you for your time. Diane, how long do you think it's quarter of? So, how long do you think you're? I'm just thinking because they're going to break at nine. So, did you? She's next anyway, so that's fine. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> um, I don't have prepared remarks, so uh, hopefully it won't take me that long. Uh, can you hear me now? Yeah. Uh, so um, I've been thinking a lot about this switch. Oh, I'm sorry. Donna Smyrniotopoulos, 18 Shorefront Park. Sorry, I'm a little scatterbrained today. Last week, I thought I was going to speak. I had had oral surgery that day. I sat in this room, listened to people, and I thought the oral surgery was not the worst part of my day. Uh, and, I, and I empathize with all of you having to sit through this also. It, it is uh, Yellman's work that you do. Uh, so as I think about kind of globally what this switch means, uh, I don't know if people in the audience are aware. I think most people are thinking we don't want our single family neighborhoods up zone to do family. I agree with them. I think you should stay out of people's neighborhoods. Um, I, I have a question about what is motivating a switch from Euclidean traditional zoning to form-based zoning. I know it's supposed to be uh, easier. Uh, it is subjective. It's based on, it's not based on uses. So a lot of things that were very objective about uh, Euclidean zoning are not true of form-based zoning. And then I started thinking about one of my favorite movies from 1989, Field of Dreams, <clears throat> which most of you have probably seen. If, if you build it, they will come. And that, I think, is the mantra of new urbanism. And new urbanism is where form-based zoning comes from. So new urbanism is exactly what it sounds like. It's urban. I don't think, and maybe I'm wrong, I haven't lived here as long as many of these people, I don't see Norwalk as urban. Uh, I think it is very much suburban. We have a non-centralized downtown. When I first moved here, I thought there was gonna be this beautiful golden bracelet linking uh, um, Washington Street with West Avenue, with downtown, that hasn't happened. I would love to see those areas revitalized, but unfortunately what has happened here historically is that we have seen gentrification. We've seen people chased out of their neighborhoods. It usually starts in the uh, more affordable parts of the city where that gentrification happens. I don't think necessarily that the switch to form-based is going to stop that from happening. And I don't know if you all are familiar with what happened in Sarasota, Florida, but they attempted to uh, switch to form-based code around 2018. Uh, and, and thank God, we, well, I know we've spent money on consultants, maybe $90,000. Sarasota spent a million dollars on uh, consultants and they wound up abandoning uh, the, uh, the attempt to go to form-based code. I wanna, I'm just gonna read what somebody else had written about that. Um, and this year, this is from 2018. 
Uh, this year, the city of Sarasota plans to wrap up a long process of replacing existing zoning and related codes with the new form-based code system. Sarasota's current system, traditional zoning, has shaped the city to date by dictating what uses are appropriate in a given area or property and setting rule-based standards like setback requirements, parking ratios, square footage or height limitations, number of units, etc., but allowing for diverse design. Traditional zoning results in distinct commercial districts and residential districts with mixing coming on a broad level like residential areas with commercial only at major intersections or along major boulevards. It allows for a mixture of diverse building styles alongside one another from housing styles on a typical neighborhood street to the differing styles of high rise condo complexes along the bayfront. We see all of this in Sarasota today. In contrast, form-based codes dictate building and open space design criteria for mixed use patterns akin to downtowns of older, more traditional cities. They strive for more urbanist downtowns, think Manhattan and European cities, dense with little or no setbacks where commercial locations interact with residential and open spaces. I don't think form-based code is appropriate for the residential areas of the city. Uh, I was listening into uh, one of the workshops and, and uh, I actually, Steve, I believe it was when you rolled back, you discussed rolling back some of the upzoning and uh, the area around NCC came up and, and uh, one of the commissioners said, well, don't we want to have more housing there so the professors can walk to campus. And I thought, <laughs> what, what planet are we living on? This is a fantasy, just like in Field of Dreams, it was a fantasy, all right? Those people weren't real. Shoeless Joe Jackson did not come back to play baseball. And Ray Kinsella's father did not come back from the dead to throw the baseball with his son. None of that happened. So there's something, there's a disconnect here, and I know planners study very hard, but mm -hmm. I think they become disconnected from the lived reality that all of us have, which is in our lived spaces, we do not, this is not an urban area, this is not what we want it to be, we like our cars, I walk a lot, I walk all the way into Marvin Beach, I, I walk all the way down to Harborview. I, I, I you know, the, we still need our cars and you can't sustain the little mom and pop grocery stores as frequently as we need them in order for us to stop using our cars. The closest grocery store to me, and we were originally scheduled for upzoning and we've been taken off is about a mile away. Not realistic that I'm going to go there on my bicycle and haul back you know, bags and bags of food. So I think, you know, I'd like you all to kind of ha take a little reality check, do a little research into the difference between form-based and Euclidean. I don't think Euclidean is so bad. And if there's any way you could hybridize it and impose the form-based in the areas that are already urbanized, but stay out of the suburban areas. Uh, and if you, if there's something you can do, I know it's a lot of work. I would appreciate it. Thank you for your time. If, if we have seven minutes, if, if we can squeeze, Diane, you're not going to be seven minutes, Diane, are you? <laughs> so if, if there's someone we can, we can squeeze in. Yeah, let's take another speaker and then you'll speak after the break. Steve, who's next on the list? Lisa Roger. I spoke last time, so. Oh, okay. Diane Lorichella is has raised her hand. Oh, Diane, will you be seven minutes? I think that would be the first question I would ask. All right, Diane, we'll bring you over and we'll let, you ask, let us know if you're going to be seven minutes or less. <laughs> Good evening. I will need about eight minutes or so. So I would I would be happy if someone else went in front of me. Thank you. Okay. Uh, okay. Just take let's the break just, now. Let's just <laughs> let's just take the break. It's uh, eight fifty four. We'll we'll get together uh, again at nine ten. Nine ten. Yeah, that's fine. Okay. Okay.
Diane, do you want to? Diane, I think. All right, are, are uh, we? Yep. Okay. Oh. <laughs> Thank you for the help. <laughs> Done like a true Girl Scout yeah, leader. Up a little bit. <laughs> We, my name. On one side, I just want to make sure we're recording. Yeah. Okay. So my name is Joe Lechek. I live on Fifty One Raymond Terrace, and um, and ladies, ladies and gentlemen of the board, um, speaking on behalf of the people of our street and the surrounding streets, I walk the neighborhood uh, often to get to and from the train station, and. I'll tell you that there are good people, young and old, of many nationalities on, on the street who own single family homes on our street. And they are, there are people who worked hard to get where they are in a single family home. <clears throat> they moved here for the reason that it's a nice neighborhood to raise a family and to care for a home. Many of these homes on our street are charming and have small lots and driveways that can't handle the volume. Making homes a two family is a downgrade and quality of life will be taken away from us. Home values diminish, the charm will be lost, the dream will be gone. The American dream, you know? Do we remember that? <clears throat> the, uh, the idea of dividing is not the answer. I ask that you retract the idea of doubling up on homes in the neighborhoods, there is no more room to spare here in East Norwalk, but greater Norwalk for that matter. Please keep it wholesome for places for, keep it a wholesome place for families to live. Thank you. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you. Good evening, Diane CC. Um, but I'm here speaking on behalf of the Board of Directors of the East Norwalk Neighborhood Association. And first, I want to thank um, all the folks who showed up, especially from East Norwalk, um, because we thought it was important for them not to just, you know, have you read their emails, but to hear from them in person and really speak from the heart on what these changes will personally mean to them. Um, I'm going to speak a little bit differently tonight, and that's why I'm generally lengthy, because I want to talk a little bit about history of why we're here. And some of what I may say tonight will actually answer some of the earlier questions about how this came to be and uh, why we're concerned with how um, you as commissioners and uh, Mr. Kleppen and staff hopefully will consider a way to course correct this um, over the next couple of months. Um, especially because, um, Mr. Shulman, I, I, I hope you can clarify this. Your statement at the beginning um, said that in all likelihood there would be a public hearing again in the fall before the September or October vote. And I just want to make sure that because we've been told before that there will be, that there actually will be a public hearing. It is so, our intention to hold an additional public hearing. Thank you. Okay, so for, for nearly a dozen years, our East Norwalk community has been the epicenter of projects, studies, plans, and decisions that have been forced upon us with little regard for public outreach and feedback. Today, East Norwalk continues to be targeted for sweeping development changes that have been repeatedly rejected by residents for years, starting with the 2019 pl master plan, the 2020 transit-oriented development study, followed by the 2022 East Norwalk Village Transit Zone, and soon portions of even the Seaview Avenue Complete Streets Project. Residents ask ENNA, why should I waste my time learning this stuff, speaking up for what I want and don't want, if they aren't going to listen to us anyway? Why do we see these plans when they are already a, quote, done deal? And this used to be a funny question for us, but it's pretty pathetic these days because we still get it, where they will ask us, do any of these commissioners actually live in Norwalk? 
Residents, quite frankly, are fed up. They're discouraged, frustrated, disappointed, and yes, angry. Angry that the city picks winners and lo losers, usually siding with deep-pocketed, well-connected developers over the residents. But more recently, with the zoning rewrite, the city is picking winners and losers among our neighborhoods. Divide and conquer to perhaps head off any citywide mobilization to fight this upzoning. But in reality, residents from every corner are speaking out. Who gets overdeveloped and who gets spared? And are the choices based solely on the most articulate or the wealthiest or who you like or dislike? Or who, who can afford the time, energy, and money to present the most compelling case or to have to hire experts and attorneys? Or this year, is it the highest voter demographic? Because one of the major frustrations East Norwalk's face is being told we have lost before the decisions are even made. Because this may say it all. And it, it will answer a question that people asked earlier. Mr. Kleppen's April statement to you said, speaking as a staff member, if there's 2,000 people that think something's a bad idea because they don't want it in their neighborhood, but if my thinking is it's something that's best for the city for the long term, I'm going to advocate for it till I'm blue in the face, and ultimately the commission decides against me, then they decide against me. Interesting choice of words, because as we would frame it, as the commission deciding for the residents. So the question is, when do the commissioners ever decide against staff? Rarely, as you know. So this will be the commission to be, so will this be the commission to be a profile in courage to listen to your fellow residents and choose to side with us this time? There are, no, there are no legal statutes that you must abide by because this is a city application to rezone and not a matter of a private landowner seeking a change. We residents hope you agree with what we see as a fundamental tenant of land use debate. Once the people have decided they don't support something that is being recommended by staff, the onus is not on the public to produce studies and case law and statistics to justify why. The onus should be on staff to prove their case for why they think the recommendation should stay. And I have to think they would be hard pressed to justify much of what is in this plan, except that Hartford is mandating population growth at cities at all costs, literally at all costs, with no regard for the strain on city services and quality of life. It shouldn't fall, fall to us mere, mortal, mere mortals to, def to defend why we don't want rock crushing plants and regional bus terminals in our neighborhoods. It should be for staff to justify it. Which brings me to, um, I'm sorry, I crossed a whole bunch of stuff out of here just to save time. Um, it does bring me to the point of how these plans get presented. Almost all of them are pretty big on the what, when, where, and how, but very little substance on why. And when we try to look at the why, we hear things like, quote, to create affordable housing. Yet there are no facts to support any of the creating of truly affordable housing, and worse, absolutely no requirement for it. There's nothing in here like would be requiring 30% affordable, consisting of 20% workforce and 10% low income. There is nothing in here that ensures a two family house would produce two affordable units inhabited by the actual owners. And even Mr. Kleppen can share with you the national trend for real estate investment firms and large developers to gobble up the former, former, former single family parcels and erect as many bedroom units at the, as they can at the highest possible rents. Also, there's nothing in here that speaks to any of the objectionable industries as providing hundreds of well-paying jobs for local residents. I mean, really, how does a transportation vehicle terminal create jobs or communication towers everywhere? And of course, many of these uses produce virtually zero tax revenue. And so the reality tonight is that East Norwalk is still in the losers category. 
because after Mr. Kleppen has modified 11 neighborhoods, with nine of them retaining single family housing, he still has not modified East Norwalk. So tonight, two things appear apparent. One, that they've dug in their heels to support the Lamont plan to double our population in 20 years and to start with the neighborhoods with train stations, excluding Rowayton, of course. <laughs> and two, that if history is any indicator of future actions, this commission may very, may very well yield to the recommendations of staff and ignore the pleas of hundreds, perhaps thousands of residents. The residents who want to preserve and enhance the quality of life for those who already live here before you go trying to pack thousand more residents into our already densely populated neighborhoods. East Norwalkers have a right to know why nine other areas have already been reverted back to single family and why you are still targeting ours. In fact, it's not just a sliver. It's 18 more streets with over 250 properties. Did you not see all this in the reviews that Mr. Kleppen provided over the past 27 months? Oh, that's right. There were no detail reviews. Except reasonable folks like East Norwalk residents would have to assume that at least Mr. Kleppen's superiors, Mrs. Vonashek and Mayor Rilling, would both have been kept thoroughly apprised of the draft recommendations all along? Or were they? Because honestly, we don't know what's worse at this point, that Mayor Rilling was never even made aware of the draft recommendations or that he was and chose to do nothing to protect East Norwalk. Because it seems that after his first public display of concern over how far reaching these changes are, a whole bunch of areas were saved why isn't East Norwalk being spared? And if it's just because we have a train station, Route 136 and a bus route, then explain why 18 streets and 250 teeny parcels in Rowayton are not being upzoned. With all due respect to Ms. Langallis. And so you may ask, why should East Norwalk be spared when clearly it is a neighborhood that contains a major transit hub? But of all people, it's you, the commissioners, that should know the answer and use it as your guide to stop this. Because no matter how you choose to frame it so you defend the decision, the fact of the matter is, is that East Norwalk now has been upzoned three times. 230 East Avenue project, the TOD designation, and the EVTZ zone all despite us being a small neighborhood and neither an urban core or downtown. If Mr. Kleppen is to be believed that a mechanism can be put in place now, it, if Mr. Kleppen is to be believed that a mechanism can be put in place now to revisit and analyze the results of this plan and adjust it in the next five years, then ENNA submits to you the fact that you cannot unring this bell once you upzone, and that you should first allow the overwhelming changes you've already made to play out. And let's see just how many of the potential thousand plus apartments actually come to fruition. Because not to do so also treats residents unfairly and gives complete benefit to developers to take the next three months to decide which zoning is best suited for them to maximize their profits the EVTZ zone and industrial zones as they exist today, or the new CD zones and conversions to marine commercial. By the way, the impact of what can happen along our waterfront is a mystery and frightening, starting with allowed uses such as hotels. ENNA urges each of you to hit the pause button. Go back, scrutinize the entire rewrite. There are lots of disturbing things we found, including a well-hidden change to allow three and a half story structures on East Avenue as of right. No special permit needed. Once again, we see the one potential protection of residential properties eroded by making higher and greater density a given. There are changes to allow bed and breakfasts on our residential roads, but yet prohibit someone from operating much needed adult daycare centers. In fact, we see little, if anything, in here that addresses aging in place 
or any consideration of the growing long-term need for affordable senior housing. But we do see the possibility of more prison halfway houses right next door to families. We see elementary and secondary schools allowed in residential, but not any school or institution for the disabled. Wow. It's almost impossible to believe, but after all the angst and frustration battling the Norton Warehouse distribution application way back when, that we still have to ask you to remove rock crushing plants, wholesale distribution centers, municipal power plants, transportation terminals, petroleum storage facilities, and more. I mean, if we're doing this at, you know, as a 30 year rewrite, I think we should do it right. And I think that we should take the opportunity to get rid of the things that are objectionable in any neighborhood in our city. Every time I, another board member or a member of the public sinks our teeth into each section of the plan, we become more discouraged by what we see the lack of robust public engagement, which we've been begging for for years. No, a small 18 by 24 sign to announce a major development just 10 days prior to a public hearing doesn't cut it. And we see a deterioration of existing residential neighborhoods that cannot and should not sustain the growth of the city while wealthy large parcels are kept intact and protected from ever having to provide affordable housing in their neighborhoods. ENA will continue to review every line in the behemoth plan, including asking questions of staff. Thank you for your responses. We do appreciate them. But for at least tonight, we are pleading with you to do this. Reject the plan that would allow three and a half story buildings on East Avenue as of right without special permits and no public hearings. Reject the plan unless and until it addresses the inequitable, inequitable public amenity bonus points that you approved to create double density already. Reject this, reject this plan that would allow hotels and large developments blocking the waterfront in the newly designated marine commercial zone, it's called SD-MC, that are currently zoned just as neighborhood businesses. And then finally reject this plan for that allows rock crushing plants, prison halfway houses, transportation bus terminals, warehouses and wholesale distribution centers, adult use establishments, among other objectionable uses or in, in either our residential or our industrial zones in 06855. Most importantly, finally, this plan would change 250 parcels on 18 of our residential streets from one to two family zone and um, we want to ask you to instruct staff to, pre to preserve every single family zone in our neighborhood. Thank you. Thank you. All right, uh, Diane Lorcello. Good evening. Can you hear me? Yes, we can. Thank you. Uh, first of all, my name is Diane Loricella, 21 Little Fox Lane in West Norwalk. Um, I wanted to thank you, uh, Zoning uh, Commission, Planning and Zoning Commission and staff and the public for participating uh, in all the many public hearings and meetings, especially uh, the last two in person and hybrid. I wanted to thank you for having a, the virtual capabilities because I am helping take care of an ill, a sick friend. So I really appreciate being able to zoom in as they say. Um, I've lived in uh, Norwalk for almost 40 years in many neighborhoods, Cranberry neighborhood, Village Creek, South Norwalk on Taylor Avenue, on Main Avenue for about 11 years, on Seaview Avenue for about 11 months. Um, I wanted, uh, it takes a lot of moving boxes and I'm having flashbacks at this moment. I just wanted to, uh, I've been uh, uh, crossing out different areas because I wanted to uh, compress what I'm saying. And also many uh, folks have said terrific and very thoughtful things that I know, I'm assured that you are listening to. I wanted to state that um, I'm not going to specify section and page numbers as 
is not the custom of almost any speaker, I will send in writing more specifics and I appreciate the opportunity to do so. I wanted to state that, um, that um, I very much support having hybrid zone changes. Um, where you place the form-based zone, I think more study is needed and there have been some good comments made about where you do not have it. I wanted to say I am in favor, I am pro homes, yet I am a renter. I wanna, I wanna shout out to renters because one should not judge why a person is a renter. There are all kinds of reasons. And many of us are very good citizens and try to help our community. But on occasion, there seems to be this feeling that zones that include renters will be down zoned and renters, most renters don't care about their community. I don't think that is so. And I think that this commission should enhance, but be more surgically specific where rentals are allowed, okay? Um, I am a senior and I agree with Ms. Cece that there is very little discussion about the future, especially with our aging um, baby boomer population of places that are truly affordable for seniors and including a true need to do a better job as far as um, educating and marketing about the most recently amended ADUs or alternative dwelling units. We need amendments ASAP because if indeed the zone changes proposed here in the draft, one of the purposes is to include affordable housing. We want to make sure that we don't cut ourselves off at the knees. And I was quite saddened that there were some I think very, very demonstrable, small thinking as far as the types of ADUs allowed for detached homes. I think you need to include in this rewrite, and you can ask the consultants and look at other towns to allow wheeled tiny homes. One of the commissioners I think meant well that they didn't wanna have trailer parks but they seem not to understand that manufactured homes and tiny homes that actually um, uh, make it less expensive for someone to have a detached home come on wheels. And then they are locked in place, landscaping is placed at the base, and they cannot occupy those tiny homes and wheeled manufactured homes unless they get a CO from the city. So there will not be illegal sewer hookups, which was one of the statements made during that approach. And the only reason I'm bringing it up is ADUs, both attached and detached will help solve our affordable housing problem without all of the um, uh, uh, drastic changes of single family zones to two family zones with a broad brush. There must be no more broad brush zoning in this city. You should limit the number of the single family homes converting to two family homes, limit the number. And I ask that you drive in and around each neighborhood, especially those that have come before you, where you see lots of uh, streets now clogged with people parking on the street, that immediately should be taken off of your list of single family zones to be converted to two family, because that means there's a problem that you have to resolve, even if it means enforcement, before you make any changes. Phase that plan in in the coming years. But it would be quite easy to see in the beautiful small neighborhoods in East Norwalk and Golden Hill. I've seen and lived in many of these areas. It is an unusual in the last 10 years that our two-way streets are really turned into one-way streets, especially if it snows, because there is a preponderance of too many people being in single family homes, many, many illegally. Um, I also wanted to suggest for the industrial zones, I think it has been, uh, it was a big mistake to, we need as many of the remaining industrial zones for clean industry, 
good paying jobs, better tax, uh, but make sure that they are good neighbors. You need to make sure they're quiet or else they're not allowed. But that would require, again, enforcement. And I will speak about enforcement at the end when I am done shortly. What is the magic number of zones we need? I think it's great that we're trying to reduce it from 31. And I agree with Mr. Kleppen when he's talked about that. But is 13 the magic number? I'm not really sure. And I don't think so. I think 31 is too much. But 13 is not the magic lucky number in this case. I know that I listened to the sustainability panel. And I do believe that because it is a very broad but important part of Norwalk's framework because we are on the coast especially, and because all of us use energy and because all of us want to reduce our costs of living and operating, we need another panel discussion. And I think, and I ask that you include uh, the people that spoke, uh, our um, individual consultants or our taxing districts, but you need to speak to people that actually do zoning for this kind of sustainability and a greener community. That is the Northeast Energy Partnership. They're up in Massachusetts. I gave the name. I will give it again and send it again in writing. It is the Connecticut Green Building Council. I am a member of the Homes and the Advocacy Committee. And Melissa Copps is a brilliant a staff person in the New Haven zoning department, she could help you with building codes and zones overlays. And lastly, the Green Bank. They have a woman named Emily Basham that helps with multifamily solar development and renewable energy. You need to talk to that type of person as well because they work with towns and zone changes and they have model language that I tried to get to you tonight, but they weren't able to get it to me. I will make sure they do within the next month. I hope for more overlay zones. Bridgeport, for instance, has a renewable energy zone below I-95 where they give incentives and mandates and they actually help uh, with the energy needs of the residential community surrounding it. They're made up of ground mounted solar panels and also uh, uh, CHP, which um, because of the hour, uh, it's combined heat and power. Uh, I would ask for you to consider a green job zone overlay. When I say green jobs, I mean manufacturing for green jobs as well as using some of the, the old factory buildings for uh, hydroponic growth of um, food and, uh, and also solar panels and wind panels, et cetera. These overlay zones could act as not only an incentive to get these green jobs at, that pay better in taxes, but pay better wages, it would be a marketing plus for our city again, in the industrial and commercial zones only. We need renewable energy zones, like I said before, that mandate, and I think for your sustainability plans, you must ask for a greater percentage on rooftops than 25. I think it should be greater than 50, quite frankly, and why not 100? And absolutely, we need white roofs, we need, um, to prepare for solar canopies in the future and green, green roofs, which are succulent plants. Uh, I'd, uh, I'm not as familiar with the phrase blue roof, but white roofs are what reflect the sun and keep help keep things cooler. Um, I'm skipping around. I think we need a contractor yard and commercial buffer zone overlay, especially in South Norwalk, East Norwalk and parts of District A, where we have commercial abutting residential. And I know that that's supposed to happen in our zone, but it's not working for us. So we need to maybe have an incentive overlay zone. Um, we need a river, pond, and harbor conservation overlay. That would include Water Street, which is going again in the same way that the Washington uh, village redevelopment went the wrong way in placing large buildings right in the 100-foot uh, zone of, of flooding. 
uh, when there were alternatives available nearby, like in the Webster Street lot, they wouldn't listen. And now we're finding large apartment and condos nearby. That is not the way to go because of coastal area management. We have to think long and hard about some changes on Water Street and any sound-based place. Because this commission, the planning and zoning has been saddled with the coastal area management referrals. Please take this more seriously and talk to the EPA Region 1 Marine Office in Stanford and Stanford City Hall. They can help you do a better job. Brownfields, they must be lists, there are lists available that UTIL did not find somehow, and there are available at DEP if you know what to ask for, and I have told you what they are. Um, but we need to make sure that we prioritize where those brownfields are so we can help those owners uh, clean them up, and some of those could become residential areas. Um, we need, and as far as other places for affordable housing and housing, which is what we're trying to do, instead of converting all, all of these special areas of single family to double family, instead plan for conversion of more fa former factory areas, office buildings, and even the, a mall, hint, hint, to resi partially residential, instead of totally changing our, um, our suburban areas. Um, I wanted to say that I ask again that this commission and people in the audience read the, the book, The Color of Law, to understand why so many of the neighborhoods on the outskirts, where I live now in West Norwalk, Cranberry, where I lived for many years, why they are so exclusive in their zoning. I do think there's plenty of room for proper ADUs, detached and attached, to welcome more affordability in the A, AA and AAA zones. Um, especially, I think that you should consider for those areas you finally do decide to convert from single family to double family, it must be owner occupied, just like your ADU law. And I think that will control the fear about, and the reality about investors being absentee landlords. Last, lastly, and I thank you for your indulgence, we must have a dual plan here for education and marketing about what people can do on their properties, both commercial, industrial, and residential. And lastly, without an enforcement plan, it has to be created now. Hire consultants to help the police and the zoning enforcement staff about this issue and, and, and empower it quickly. It's not rocket science. There's not enough staff, not enough time, not enough money and political will spent on enforcement. And I think that will help us become a safer community, a more welcoming community. And, and we must ask the question, how big do we want Norwalk to be? No one's asked that question. We need to answer that question. I thank you for your time. Thank you. And I apologize, I, I cannot read this name uh, or the address. It's T-I-G or T-I-Q, lives at 66 something. You want to try? I'm gonna grab the next one while you're doing that. Um, George, third George, maybe going once, going twice. Mary Sutton. Who wants to talk? Anybody left that wants to? Anybody who hasn't? Anybody who has some online speakers too. Let's hold on. Can we do? Because there's people on Zoom who have, probably haven't spoken yet, and there's I know people raising their hands that have spoken. So if we could, anybody who hasn't spoken first would be good. Here, uh, you want to grab the? Um, okay, let's let's grab um, Brian. Grab a uh, Liz first. And here, then. Liz Banish. Liz, if you're speaking, we cannot hear you. Yeah. Still can't hear you. You might have to check your um, your input, your audio input to make sure you have the mic right microphone on. Um, <clears throat> I'll come back to you. 
Uh, then we have Anthony Pavia. Pavia, sorry. Oops. You hear me? There you go. Yeah. Oh. Hello. Yeah, go ahead. Okay, thank you. Um, my name is Anthony Pavia. I reside at 34 Buckingham Place. Um, I am speaking tonight as a co-founder of the City Hall Neighborhood Association. Um, and I, I'm going to keep my comments super brief. Um, you know, in, in terms, and I'm going to take it a little different, a little bit of a different focus. Um, and, and in looking at um, density um, and looking at the uh, East Avenue corridor, which is is my neighborhood, it's the association's neighborhood. Um, you know, I think that um, looking at pedestrian safety and traffic is is critical, and um, is going to be something I think that you know, regardless of the zoning and looking at the zoning uh, changes being proposed, I think should be considered concurrently. Um, and you know, I, I think um, the city has gotten ahead of that. To a point, I know that Transportation Mobility and Parking has commissioned a, uh, a traffic study, um, but it seems that the, the zoning changes are going to be looked at and, and moved on perhaps before that's concluded. Um, I think it's a theme that's totally consistent with an increase in density. Um, you know, Norwalkers have, should receive some concessions in, extension, in, in exchange for all of the negatives of uh, that have been brought up tonight. Um, you know, obviously, I think there's positives, but and I think lower taxes are always el are elusive, um, and, and I think taxpayers deserve some of the amenities um, as the as this density is 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 brought online here. Um, you know, I think um, you know I think taxpayers and and residents. Um, you know, I was a renter here as well before I purchased a, a single family home. So um, I agree with the speaker prior that rent renters are sort of um, being looked at in a negative light to, to some extent. Um, I'm also an, an, uh, a landlord in, in town as well. So I, 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 some of the sentiment tonight um, around absentee landlords is, is a little bit irritating uh, to hear. Um, but that said, you know, I, I think that um, uh, the, the city should get this, the residents should get some benefit from this increased density and um, it should be going into making our neighborhoods livable and walkable, more aesthetically pleasing, and most importantly, safe. Uh, the East Avenue corridor which again is where I live and which where our association is, is li literally the prime example of a neighborhood that continues to be divided um, and is in fact, um, um, could be um, negatively impacted by a, a further increase in density. Um, you know, why can't it be an example to all of Norwalk that, you know, maybe um, that, you know, we, we look to look, implement these safety and traffic studies prior to looking at any zoning changes. Um, and so, um, you know, I, I think that, um, you know, a, a hedge to increased density could be investment in road infrastructure, pedestrian safety, walkability, parks, open space. These are all, these are all benefits to citizens that could come with this increased density. Um, and, you know, I, I, you know, I, I think that that should be something that should be considered to look at. So, uh, those are my, those are my comments and I thank the commission for its work, um, and for the ability to, uh, to contribute tonight. Thank you. Yeah. You can, yeah. I'm sorry to get your name. So. <laughs> oh, hi. I'm Lucia Molinelli, and I live at 25 Gray Hollow Road up in Silvermine. I am also a realtor, so I look at this these issues from many different places. I've lived here for almost, I just realized it's 50 years. Uh, what I moved, why did I move to Norwalk? Because it was affordable and it was a nice place to live. You had a nice quality of life. 25 years ago, I took a carriage ride. And why I'm saying 25, 25, it was my 25th wedding anniversary. And we took a ride around Norwalk in a carriage. And it was lovely. And what you started to realize is it was a great place. There was an openness. And 
Newark really wasn't a city. It's kind of in between a town and a city. If you compare this to other cities, I think the crime rate and things like that are a lot less. And that's all wonderful things. Why people, you know, live here and why I continue to stay here. When you start in increasing the density and changing zonings, uh, you know, whether it's uh, right now, I live in AAA zoning. If you go ahead and you combine this and you start making it more dense, you're going to change the whole quality of life. And that isn't why people live here. This should be responsibility of the whole state and all the towns around to give more affordable housing. If we go ahead and we add up the number of units, we really supply a great deal of that affordable housing. And it's the responsibility of everyone in the state and the whole, all of the towns, everyone that lives around here. It shouldn't be our total responsibility. We've done a great job. And if we're making this kind of a decision to change zoning, this should be done. Take it slow and figure out what that's going to do. I've seen changes downtown and I don't find them to the, to the good quality of life. I see what's, you know, you go downtown Norwalk. I don't even want to go down there by the library. And it used to be, you know, not too bad. It was not that much of a city, but now with the amount of buildings and everything, and you're gonna make this even more dense, let's take a step back. We've got to do this slowly. You want it for the best of Norwalk, that's what we're all here for. That's why you work so hard. And that's why I do in selling it and living here. So don't do anything fast. It's not our, just our responsibility, it's everyone's. And every, all the other towns have to, you know, take up a little of this of what we're trying to do and hold off before we destroy what Norwalk has. And that's not a good thing. Thank you. Um, so try to be mindful of time. I only have about a half hour left, so I'll go through. Um, Steve Alcesta. Uh, hi, can you hear me? Yes. Uh, my name's uh, Steve Alcesta. I live at 29 Cedar Crest Place. Uh, my wife and I moved to Norwalk uh, about a year ago, uh, 37 years old. Um, I, uh, first of all, to the, uh, uh, to the board, uh, fully support what you're trying to do here. Um, I appreciate you uh, putting forth this plan to increase uh, density and to do something to make housing more affordable. Um, I feel like um, it's, it's difficult uh, for folks in my generation to afford mm -hmm. a place to live. Um, housing prices have risen so much, I think primarily due to the lack of housing supply. And I do agree with the previous speaker who said that this is a statewide problem, not just a Norwalk problem. Um, the other towns around here are definitely far behind Norwalk, uh, but I appreciate the board looking to do something and, and I fully support the increased density. Um, I know that no plan is perfect. Personally, I would like to see um, more area opened up to multifamily homes as of right. Um, but, uh, but I wanted to come out today to, uh, to sh uh, show my support to the plan. Uh, I'd also like to uh, just briefly mention that uh, many people who, uh, perhaps some people who would benefit most from this type of zoning change, uh, find it difficult to come to meetings like this. They may have to work multiple jobs, they may have children to take care of. It's harder even for someone my age um, to get out of work and uh, get to a meeting at six o'clock. So I would ask the uh, members of the board to take that into consideration that there's a lot of people out there um, whose, uh, whose opinions might not be getting expressed in a forum such as this, um, and that, that you represent all of, all of them as well. Um, and, uh, one last thing, I, I do work at um, uh, 
Uh, I'm an attorney. I work at the courthouse in Stanford, and I see a lot of second order effects uh, to housing affordability. Uh, there are a lot of uh, people, as I think I heard someone mention earlier, uh, people are, you know, living multiple families to a single family home. Uh, people are renting rooms where like four or five uh, people are living in. Uh, there are victims of domestic violence who can't find other locations to to move to, so they don't want to leave or they can't leave the home where their abuser is. There's just as me, as much as there may be, um, you know, there may be traffic issues or or inconvenience issues to citizens with increased density. There are um, there are serious problems that are ongoing right now because we don't have enough density. Um, and so I would uh, I would ask that uh, the the board consider that, um, and also the fact that uh, you know as I, we we purchased our home here, but I also understand that it's not the town's responsibility to ensure that my home is an investment that uh, continues appreciating over time. It's the town's responsibility to look after the welfare of the citizens. Um, so I would ask that you that uh, even though I don't think that uh, increased zoning will cause property values to fall. Um, I think that that's uh, generally a uh, 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 false narrative. Um, I would ask that uh, the town not overly consider the uh, the investment of single family homeowners. Uh, this is, I think the increased density is good for the welfare of the citizens of Norwalk as a whole. Uh, and I, I think you're doing a great job. I just wanted to come out here and say that. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, next, uh, Liz Banish. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me? Yes. Hi, good evening. Thank you so much for allowing me to speak. Um, so, yeah, my name is Liz Banish. I live at 25 Maple Street. Um, it's an apartment, so I am a renter. I moved here about three years ago, and I'm speaking as a resident who is very much against this measure of rezoning. Um, but like the previous renters that spoke before me, um, I'm very much for affordable housing. Um, so I do want to chime in about that really, really quickly. Um, so I live in a small apartment building on Maple Avenue or street that is right next to like one of these large behemoth condo buildings that we are seeing kind of pop up all over areas like this, right. And which these upzoning measures support, um, because these are buildings built by these international developers that, as people have mentioned, have no interest in the local aesthetics or movements of the community that they're building in. They don't live here, so they don't actually have an investment here. Um, that being said, uh, as a young person, you know, I'm 35 now, and, you know, I love this town so much. Um, I've been living here, like I said, for three years, and I work um, at a local cultural center, a nonprofit that I'm so happy to provide so much cultural enrichment to the community. And I also volunteer at the aquarium as a diver. So um, I have a lot of investment in this town and I, you know, I'm very charmed by it since I lived here. Um, and it does break my heart to see scenery like this, to see communities like this fall prey to these extremely large developers um, that push the income bracket of a labor force like myself to the brink. Um, you know, your towns need people in hospitality. You need them that work in healthcare. You need the people that work in food. Um, none of us can afford to live here anymore. Um, and I realize that myself, I am extremely an outlier. I can't believe that I can actually afford to live here. Um, that being said, uh, my rent eats up about 70% of my first paycheck. So, you know, I too am on the absolute brink um, and it cannot absolutely see prices go up anymore or else I'm going to have to get out of here. So, you know, these are vocations. These are jobs that are the backbone of any community. And we, you know, are usually the ones that are commuting vast distances to get here every day. So talk about infrastructure under pressure, right? So it would really behoove you to have affordable ho housing options, yes, but ask yourself what affordable actually is, because I have a feeling that 
this so-called affordability that's mentioned in these upzoning of the uh, single family to the multifamily isn't actually truly affordable. Um, so I just wanted to have a, a chance to mention that, um, and especially as somebody who volunteers for the aquarium and is deeply concerned with the local ecology, um, the watershed of Norwalk is, you know, the kind of bread and butter of this whole place. And it's, you know, the oysters, all that jazz, the beach, beautiful. But, um, you know, it really can't sustain that much more density either. So, you know, I ask you to really consider that uh, as people that claim to, you know, have investment in this community as well. So show it. Thank you. Thank you. All right, and then uh, Christy Sweeney. Chris, you just have to unmute yourself. It should be at the bottom of your screen. You just click that hand. Or excuse me, the microphone. Uh, if that's not working, Steve, I don't know if anyone else. Uh, it looks like the we have one more who I believe spoke at the last meeting, but I can bring them over. So it's, Mr. Chairman, it's 10 o'clock, so you're your call on what you want to do. I think you can bring them over. Uh, it's went, yeah, went hi. Here. Thank you for taking my call. My name is Steve Pablacas. I'm at 41 Seaview Avenue. And you're right, I did speak uh, at the last meeting. Uh, much of what I want to say has been eloquently stated by my neighbor. Uh, Nancy Skimica earlier in the meeting. I just want to echo my support for her positions as well as the positions of uh, Diane CC of the East Norwalk Neighborhood Association. So uh, basically I'm against the single family to two family change. I think we will see high density, higher traffic, and basically uh, the quality of life I think will suffer. Uh, the last caller, is somebody that you know mentioned affordability. I think affordability of home ownership will go down because of high density. Uh, I can give you an example, I, and everybody knows, we get letters in the mail asking for our property. I have a multifamily home. And they say, we want your home and we'll pay cash. So to a young 35 year old, unless they got tons and tons of cash, they will be outbid. So they will not be able to afford a home, which will, in theory, you buy a home, it's a multifamily, you rent it out, helps you pay the mortgage. That won't happen because they cannot buy because they're competing against developers and against people with a lot of money. So they will not be able to purchase that home. And as they said, their rents will go up because developers are looking at you know nickels and dimes, so they will the rents will go up. So affordability for somebody that young, I can sympathize. Okay, and you can research this online. Affordability does, does not make home ownership. Of, uh, I mean, high density does not make affordability of uh, home ownership better. Okay. So I basically though I think everything has been said, uh, and I think. There's been a lot of good work by the committee. And uh, you know, you, you're to be applauded. It's difficult, it's difficult work. And you've done some good things. The regulations are easier to read. There's some interactive maps. You've used technology a lot better. This is all good stuff. We need to use that and we appreciate it. So, but I request that you pause at this point and set, uh, try and get some more feedback. Um, in a way, you know, I like to see some of the rebuttals that people on the committee have. I'm sure there, there's some good ones on both sides. And uh, that's what we need though. We need rebuttals, we need opinions, we need feedback, we need to postpone some things. But I appreciate your work. And uh, I just hope that you begin to value the opinions of the residents and not so much the developers. So with that, uh, thank you uh, for taking my call. Thank you for your time and have a good night. Thank you. Uh, is there anyone uh, else who uh, wishes to speak? 
Uh, wait, Richard. Um, no, you've both spoken. Richard, go ahead. Good evening. Um, Rich Bonifant, 17 Park Hill Avenue. I'm not going to reiterate what I've said at the last one where I poured my heart out. I'm from uh, Bet the Bestwood neighborhood. I just want to say I was proud of them. I put a flyer in a lot of about 80 mailboxes, and I, and I think you got some responses from that. Um, what I'm really going to say is that a lot of people tonight, well, the first thing I am against is taking single families and turning them into two families. So just so you know where I'm coming from. But a lot of people are talking about postponing, take your time, do that. I'll tell you what, if you didn't hear from enough people that my suggestion, my positive suggestion, I think, is that the board ought to tell the director to say, take the single family, convert it into two family off the table because no one wants it, okay? Just take it, out of the, take it out of the equation altogether. And then, then you can work on a whole summer and a fall of working on your waterfronts, working on what goes commercially here or there, buffer zones, all those other things. But just take the, you will take a lot of anxiety out of the people of Norwalk, all right? They're, they're, out, they're nervous, they're afraid. They're wondering like, you know, is it going to be a huge election issue where like, you know, all I'm just trying to say is you got an opportunity. I think you heard enough on that. Make your discussion and just say, take the single family going into two family out of the equation. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Tom Gabriel and unmute. Can you hear me? Hello? Yeah. yeah. So I've attended this meeting. I've attended last week's meeting and Tom Gabriel, I'm sorry, Tom Gabriel, 40 Field Street, Norwalk, Cranberry section of Norwalk. I've lived in Norwalk, fortunate enough to marry my wife and move to Norwalk over 35 years, 40 years ago. And I've lived in the Golden Hill section. I've lived in the Broad River section. I am, you know, lived in various parts of the city. Now I currently reside in Cranberry. And the one thing I've heard that I haven't gotten an answer for is why? Why this rezoning? And I hear density and I hear all these other things. And I responded to a Nancy on Norwalk column where I compared Norwalk to Stanford, Danbury, Westport, Wilton, New Canaan, and Darien. And I compared the land mass, usable land mass, to the total population. And Norwalk, out of all those areas, had the fourth highest land mass, but yet we have the highest density per acre of people. And what I don't understand is, with all these apartments going up and all these other things happening, why we are 14 point X percent of the Connecticut statute for affordable housing, well above what they require. I don't understand why we feel that we have to continue to put more and more and more people in this city. That's my first confusion. My second confusion is this. We have not heard from any quote unquote developers other than the one this evening who wanted to raise the height limit on apartments so they can get more revenue because they can make more units. That's what everybody's been saying. Everybody's been saying, we want investors to come in take our real estate and make money, i.e., for all of you on this panel, rich dad, poor dad, read the book, rich dad, poor dad, use other people's money to make money. That's not why I moved to Norwalk. I moved to Norwalk for everything 
that everybody else has said for 10 plus hours. I moved to Norwalk because the city has a micro, a, a, a microcosm of different areas with different people, different kinds of personalities where people want to move and live. And that's what I did. Certain members on the board, they worked in areas where they didn't have industrial areas. They didn't have other kinds of things. And they're trying to force feed Norwalk into certain things. I apologize for my, my heatedness, but I've sat here for 10 hours watching this. And I've watched people on this Zoom meeting and their faces. And I've watched people that have been engaged. And I've watched others that are off in La La Land doing other things. No offense, but the people in La La Land doing other things have already checked out. You work for us. You were elected by us. You should listen to us, not a developer that wants to develop a certain area, not to make more space for people to come in and grab things. I apologize, but I am now in retirement. I bought my home knowing that I would retire and I would live out my life in an area that I wanted to live in. And now all of a sudden, you want to come in and start changing things and saying, no, you can't. It reminds me of when I bought my home. When I bought my home, I went to a meeting. The taxes were being reevaluated. The individual from the Common Council said, I'm sorry, miss, who was complaining about taxes going up. I'm sorry, miss. You are house rich, cash poor. You need to move. I'm sorry. That's not the way it should be. I bought my house to live here. I bought my house to live in a city where for 40 years I've seen it grow and I'm happy. Please do me a favor. Don't look at some new picture makes perfect zoning. I don't care about a picture. Sometimes a picture is worth a thousand words. Sometimes it's not. Please do me a favor and just reevaluate your decision. You are going to make a lot of people's lives worse than they should be. Thank you so much. I apologize for my tone. I think there's one more gentleman, Mr. Schumann. Okay. Um, Brian, do you have anyone else? Well, that's it for online speakers, Mr. Schulman. Okay. Jim Anderson, Two Old World Court. I spoke last uh, meeting. Um, I'm just going to probably bring up again the same thing, but I, and I can't believe it hasn't been brought up this past ten hours. Uh, a pretty obvious thing, and I think Lou, you, Mr. Schulman, I'm sorry. Um, you, I think you wrote it down. You noted it. I-95, exit 16, both sides, converging intersection. Again, for those that don't know what it is, it's a proven intersection studies. It increases the flow of a highway to go into neighborhoods, both sides. So Anthony Pavia, City Oil, you're going to get a lot more cars on East Avenue on that side. Diane, we're going to get a lot more cars at a faster rate into East Norwalk. That's what it will happen. It is going to happen. State paid $4 million for the property by Rite Aid. It already looks like crap. Uh, and the, the weeds and stuff is just horrible. Anyway, they, whatever it is, they took down a lot of trees. They're working on 95. That is going to happen. It's going to be the first intersection in the state of Connecticut. And it does work. It's happened in other uh, states. Keep that in mind, guys. That's all I want to say. Um, good night. Thank you.
Yeah, is there anyone here who uh, wishes to speak who hasn't had a chance? Uh, please. Good evening. It's late. I'm and I'm got all kinds of thoughts going in my head. This is Marlene Herrick. I live at uh, 48 Emerson Street, East Norwalk. Well, it's not East Norwalk, actually, because even though the exit says East Norwalk, Google decided I live in Norwalk. So um, thank you, Google. Um, <clears throat> I did want to reiterate what Penny had to say much earlier. And um, coming up Emerson Street, it's become a... Um, a disaster. Uh, my friend down the street moved to England. She rented out her house. She now has three cars that are now taking over her property. Uh, another woman took over a three-story building, renovated it. It looks really great, but she's renting it out to various people who are who come in and rent out for a week or two weeks or something. So, but there are the whole street now is lined on both sides with solid cars. The traffic is speeding up the road to get into 136, to get into Westport, to bypass that silly little light at the end of Winfield and Amherst and, and um, East Avenue. Um, I, I spent so much time listening. I said, geez, am I gonna, do I really wanna go to this meeting you've got on the, um, on the uh, Wells Fargo building. And you had one of your members who stood here at the end. He said, first off, we had the lawyer who said, well, they all, they all accused us of, of not, wanting, not wanting to have the building there. And I never heard anybody in that meeting say, we didn't want the building. We just wanted the density lowered. And yet, and then some person on your board here uh, stood up and said, well, we don't have a traffic problem down in South Norwalk. And, and and I'd go, well, what the hell does that have to do with East, East Ave, East, East Norwalk? Um, and so he badgered everyone on this board and you guys eventually voted to say, yes, 77 units is great. Let's put it in. Then you had some idiot woman who said, Oh, I think we need, I think we need a bus stop. We should take the parking off the, off the road here and put in a new, a new bus stop. I don't know how you paid somebody so stupid and ignorant when, when 75 feet away, there's been a bus stop on East Avenue for 75, a hundred years. I don't know. And so, but, but you all decided that we needed to do that too. So, um, Again, I'm going to repeat the, this movie, The Dimming, D-I-M-M-I-N-G. And it talks about solar cells and the uselessness of solar cells. I don't know who that woman is who's talking about we should have white roofs. The last time I looked at my address, I lived in East Norwalk, Connecticut. I don't live in California any longer, where I was 30 years. Um, they need white roofs, and um, but we in Connecticut don't need white roofs. Thank you very much. Um, some of her other proposals were a little bit wacko. Um, I don't. I don't particularly appreciate people who are talking about 15-minute cities. And that's the New World Order, the Davos group, who want, who've already took, turned a number of little hamlets in England into 15-minute cities. So if Susie wants to go visit her mom uh, 50, uh, 50 miles away, she's prohibited from doing that because she can't get a gas card to give her the money to get that. Um, and if people aren't aware of what the New World Order is doing, you really ought to check it out. Um, I don't like the idea of more density. East, North, East, East Avenue is becoming a horror. To go from, to go from my house into, in, to get on the um, I-95 South is um, it's becoming treacherous and uh, they still haven't graded the bumps going into the bridge to take that left down. Uh, we've got so much congestion where the where the seven um, between 16 and 14, where the, all the, the traffic is merging in. So everything gets backed up and it's kind of dangerous. Um, there's been, oh yeah, my suggestion for housing is to take that disaster that is 
the giant fish or whatever it's called, that stupid mall. I won't go into the mall. I won't pay for parking at that mall. You, you guys gave permission for those developers to put in that, that hideous mall and, and you've got to pay for parking. If I need to get to Apple, I'm going to friggin' Trumbull to go to Apple up there. That, that thing should be turned into your housing units. You've got plenty of parking and you've got plenty of building space there. And if not, then put it into um, um, a new um, trade uh, 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 a trade school for people to actually educate our young people coming out of high school to give them a trade. Um, there, there are no, you know, people aren't going into plumbing and electricians, becoming electricians and stuff. They're not, they're not educated in that realm. Education, that's, that's a major thing. Turn them all into a, into a place of education that's useful for the community. Um, it, um, um, I, I want to thank everyone who spoke tonight. Um, I am really, except for that silly 37 year old who thinks we should have more density. Um, let him go to a different state. Um, uh, tell him to go to New York. That's a, that's that, that, that that serve him. Um, but I appreciate everyone who, who spoke this evening and um, for your eloquence and, um, and your um, um, great observations. Please don't turn my town into more density. We don't need more housing to, to um, put in two, two family housing units. It makes a horror on the, on the streets. People don't park in the driveways. They park on the street. And um, um, it's, it's very difficult. It becomes very difficult to move, maneuver around. We had an ambulance and a fire, a fire um, uh, truck and police um, on Villaway Road, and they had to have police at the beginning and the end of Villaway Road to block it off because they had to have the, uh, the fire engine there because somebody had a, a, a medical emergency, but they had to stop the traffic from going down there. So, um, and that's because of the density on those on that street. Um, okay. Thank you. Thanks. We should speak. Please. I think she's going to go. Uh, I think she's going, and then, then you can go. Please. Do you want to bring the mic over here? <coughs> Thank you. My name is Courtney Austin, and I think I'm probably next to oldest that's spoken here. I've been in Norwalk since 1932 when I was born here. My first, my first home was a little house on Fort Point Street. It's still there. I have pictures of my great grandfather holding me from the christening in 1932. <laughs> We moved from there to the Morrow House on Eversley Avenue. And we lived there for a year. And it was during the Depression. And my father couldn't get a job. And so we moved to Washington, DC. And two years later, we moved back to Norwalk. And we lived in Norwalk at Harbor View until uh, in rental housing until uh, I was six years, eight years old and we moved into 145 East Avenue. And I have been there ever since, except for when I was married. But my parents bought the house in 1940 for $4,000. And my father was in real estate. He was on the one of the uh, uh, boards. He was on the, I believe the, uh, 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 appeals for uh, um, tax tax appeal board, but I'm not really sure. He was president of the real estate. He started that business in a little front uh, office of my grandmother's home at 213 East Avenue, which is now the gas station on the corner of Fitch Street. Now, I've been here a long time and things have been big changes and some of them are good and some of them are disastrous. And Norwalk has a classic, a classic record of municipal incompetence, 
And what are the things, same things done that can't be fixed? And it's too late to fix them. But East Avenue doesn't have railroad tracks down the front of it, trolley tracks. It has four lanes instead of two. I wouldn't dream of putting a child on East Avenue on a bicycle. But things have changed, and they're bound to change. But I want to say this. There was a man named Joe Roscoe, and I don't know if any of you remember him. Anybody remember Joe? Joe wrote little articles for the Norwalk Hour. When I say little, I mean little. And the last article I saw that he wrote before he died, he was complaining about the lights in City Hall burning all night long. And I think there's still some that burn all night long. And he wrote it in two little verses, four lines each. And that's all that was there. And I wrote a poem the week later, and I said, thanks a lot for Joe Roscoe. And you said just exactly what I want to say in 40 words. 14 words, I think it was. It was just four lines. And that's what's happening tonight. You're hearing over and over and over again the same, same problems. I don't have these problems. I have had my house ever since I inherited it from my mother in 1953. I worked for the state of Connecticut for 25 years. The last four years, I worked 400 overtime hours every year so that I could retire. I have a good pension. It's expensive to keep my house, but I don't have television. I don't have a computer. I don't have a cell phone and I don't have a car. Well, let's say my car is 2002, I think it is. It's small, doesn't burn much gas. I don't have things I don't need. It costs a lot to keep up that big 14 room house on East Avenue. Now I'm not alone. I have caregiver. I have somebody coming in to take care of me. There are a lot of senior citizens that are in my boat too, that are paying medical expenses that they never dreamed of. I can afford it because I planned for it. I gave up things a long time ago. People are not willing to give up things now. If you ask a young couple, What's the most important thing? They probably will tell you their cell phone. Yes? No? <laughs> but it's important. It's important for them. I'm not saying it's wrong, but I don't think there are many people in Norwalk that don't have a television, don't have a computer, don't have a cell phone. And it doesn't really matter. Those things aren't important. At 91, they aren't important. Really, they aren't important. You can't get along with them, and you can't get along without them. I can't tell you how many times I would have wanted to go to a Zoom meeting, and I don't even know how to turn on a computer. And I can't listen to what you're talking about. And not a, most of the time, it's not conversation. Most of it is bang, 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 on a approval of variances and things like that. And the variances, East Avenue, I went to the zoning office about East Avenue and I, how is this going to affect me? He said, don't worry about it. You're in the village historic district. The only thing that's going to affect you is two and a half stories. Well, let me tell you about two and a half stories. I've got one in the backyard and my father hadn't planted a whole row of hemlocks across there. I'd have them looking into my swimming pool when I was skinny dipping. <laughs> Believe me, that would not be a pleasant sight. <laughs> but you want to build a three and a half story next to me. You can't do it because John Eversley, who bought that property in 1741, when he left it to his family, he had the presence of a mind put a stoning variance on, a, not a variance, a restriction, so that nobody in the three houses, my house and either side of me, can put anything in front of 35, 145 East Avenue. 
145, 143, 147 all have the same frontage. You can look up on the, on the hill. They all have the same frontage. You're going to find that there are other prices of properties that will not allow the six foot setback that you've got on some of these places. It's just, you just don't know. You're destroying a lot of things. The house up at the end of Eversley Avenue, that wasn't the fault of the man that burned it or that took it down. That was the building department because the building department can't handle all the building departments. You can't handle the complaints, the zoning complaints. I have complained since 1953 about the big hotel over there, the big apartment house, because they now have six to eight cars parked in front of the setbacks. And nothing has been done about it. I've got copies of those at home. I never throw anything out. I've known, that's it. Uh, uh, Joe Rusco said it in six words. I can't say it. It's just, <laughs> you know, it's just, it's going on and on and on. It's a classic. You can't handle it. I mean, I'd listen to you on the Zoom. I haven't said anything. I didn't say anything last time, did I? But you can't do it. You can't handle it. It's bing, 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 bing. I've listened to your meetings. You just don't have the capacity to handle the variances, setback variances, additional parking variances, variances to put a 46 room, a 46 bed dormitory across from the Baptist church. Last week, I was coming down East Avenue about five o'clock on Friday afternoon, and two kids crossed in front of the Baptist church carrying backpacks going over to their cars on Eversley Avenue, on uh, Buckingham Place or uh, uh, Lockwood Lane, because they can't park in the 10 parking spaces that are allowed for that building. Thank you very much. Thank you. Now, we said we said we were going to end at uh, 1030. It's 1033. I believe we have one more speaker. Um, My name is Natasha Filia. I live at 20 Sunset Hill Avenue. Sorry. My name is Natasha Filia. I live at 20 Sunset Hill Avenue, which is right up the street here. I bought here and I knew that I was going to be in the center of town and I was fine with that. I invested in this city. My family is a multiracial family and we chose this town because it's an oasis in a sea of same. And this town made that list because it's a great town. I didn't mean that, I, I didn't think I was gonna get upset. <laughs> it made that list because it's a great town. And the things that you want to do to it are going to change the character of this town that you don't live in. I love what's happened to this city. I've lived here for 30 years. It's grown and we continue to be an oasis in the sea of same. Let's keep developing it in a smart way. That doesn't mean to abandon the things that made it great. Great neighborhoods, single family neighborhoods, multifamily neighborhoods. We're not saying that we can't have both. We're just saying, don't change things that aren't broken. Don't break things because you can. Purposeful development, that is what we need. I'm asking you to think before you do something that cannot be put back in the bottle. We've invested in this town. We've trusted you with our investment. For many of us, our homes are part of our retirement package. So many people here who are talking to you, 
You're playing with their futures. I have two sons who, one is graduating from law school next year. The other one is graduating from undergrad. They both have to move back in with me because they can't afford to live here. And if you think that increasing density is gonna make their life easier, you're wrong. If density was the solution to affordability, we'd all be living in Manhattan. <laughs> I want you to think about what you're doing. You're not creating a future for our kids. You're not creating a future where they can buy a house. You're not. You are telling yourselves that. You're making developers very wealthy. Kids who want to live here can't. They're moving to BlackRock. They're moving up the line. They're not staying here. And you're creating a transitory community. People aren't going to buy houses in a town where the schools can't fund the teachers. You're not thinking this through. Again, no one is saying that we don't want to develop the town. No one is saying that we don't, that we don't want to develop zones of culture or zones of industry. But it doesn't need to happen in our neighborhoods. We don't need hotels in our neighborhoods. We don't need um, bed and breakfast. I don't know what else we heard tonight. It's just insanity. It's insanity. It's happening. I mean, it's, I can't even believe the things that we heard tonight. So anyway, that's all I want to say. I just, this city is, is special for a reason. Let's remember the things that made it special. Let's improve the things that can be improved, but don't change things that aren't broken. You are the breakers. You can decide, are you going to break it or are you going to fix it? That's it. Thank you. Okay. We're, we're going to close uh, the uh, public hearing. Uh, we've exceeded our time, so we will put off discussion uh, for future meetings. We have uh, quite a few meetings scheduled uh, during, during uh, the summer months. Um, before we go to adjournment, just a reminder, uh, we have a meeting next week, July 5th, uh, 6 o'clock. Uh, Steve, is uh, that scheduled to be a Zoom meeting? I believe so, yes. Okay. Um, so that is our next meeting. Um, I hope uh, everybody has a I happy think... and healthy July 4th. You recall, is the... Pardon me? Is the water coming tomorrow night? Uh, yeah. There is, um, just a reminder if you didn't see, there is a, a, the circus study going on for the South Norwalk flood resiliency that meeting is tomorrow night. That's all virtual, but it is uh, tomorrow night. I think it starts at 6.30. 6 right. Thank you. Okay. Uh, with that, can I have a motion to adjourn? I, Richard makes the motion. I happily <laughs> second. Darius seconds. All those in favor, of show of hands. Uh, Aye. We're adjourned. Oh. Thank you all very much for coming. Oh,